Mr. Alexander. We're all set. We live? Yes, sir. Good evening. The Proviso Township High School regular meeting of the Board of Education will now come to order on August 10th, 2021 at 544 p.m. Ms. Grant, could you please call the roll? Sure. Mrs. Kelly? Present. present. Mrs. Medina? Present. Patterson, absent. Ms. Grant, present. Mr. Belchieros? Absent. Mr. Wagner? Absent. Mr. Alexander? Here. You have a quorum. Great. Can I get a motion to retire executive session for the purposes of the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees? Specific individuals who serve as an independent contractors in a park, recreational, or educational setting, or specific volunteers of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee, a specific individual who serves as an independent contractor in a park, recreational, or educational setting, or a volunteer of the public body, or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting to consider an increase in compensation to a specific employee of the public body that is subject to the Local Government Wage Increase Transparency Act may not be closed and shall be open to the public and posted and held in accordance with this Act, 5 ILCS 120 2 C 1. Also collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees, 5 ILCS 120 2 C 2. Even so. Litigation when an action against affecting or on behalf of a particular public body has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal, or when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis for the finding shall be recorded and entered into the minutes of the closed meeting. 5 ILCS 120 2C11. So moved. Second. Ms. Grant, please call the roll. Uh, Mrs. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Medina? Aye. Patterson absent, Ms. Grant, aye. Mr. Belchieres absent, Mr. Wagner, aye. Mr. Alexander, aye. The motion carries. We are in closed session at 5:26 p.m.
second. Can I get a motion to reconvene the regular meeting of the Proviso Township High School Board of Education? Second. Ms. Grant, please call the roll. opportunities to empower each student. Our graduates are prepared for college, careers, and to serve as contributing members of a dynamic global society. Thank you, Ms. Grant. At this time, the Board of Education opens the floor for citizens' comments. When the agenda was posted for this meeting, a link for citizens to submit comments in the form of a video was provided. Please be informed that this will be our mode of operating during the pandemic. Comments that have been received will be played for the Board and submitted into the record. The board will also receive public comments from any individuals present this evening and have submitted a request to address the board per the established procedures. We believe that all participants in the meeting desire the best outcomes for our students, families, and communities. As a reminder, this meeting is being live streamed and will also be archived and available on the district website. Drum roll, please. Um, we have two video comments, so we're going to go ahead and do those first. Great. How many do we have that we have any present? Um, oh. Hang on one second. Hold on one second. Uh, yeah, we do. We have a handful of people who are present. And the business. One of the Proviso Teachers Union. On June 15, 2021, at 10.30 a.m., Dr. Henderson had a meeting with the counselors from all three schools and the PTU. He wanted to discuss placement for the 2021-2022 school year. He stated counselors needed to be moved to different schools because the majority of African-American counselors are at West, all counselors at PMSA are white, and the majority are Hispanic at East which is a false statement. He asked them to take it upon themselves to decide who should relocate where. If they didn't agree to relocate themselves, he would do what he has to do. The counselors declined the offer to relocate themselves. On June 21st, I sent Dr. Henderson an email stating that the counselors are requesting a meeting with him to discuss the emotional needs and the potential damage any changes may have on our students prior to making this Vision. I also asked him to supply some dates and times that would work for this meeting. He never received a response, so a second request was sent to him on July 1st, in which the entire board was copied on. As of today, no response has been received. This unprofessional behavior is unbecoming of a superintendent who stresses transparency and wanting to work with stakeholders. On July 2nd, six counselors received a notice of transfer. Both the counselors and PTU believe these changes will have a negative impact on our students. Most students have not been in person in over a year. Students have built relationships with their counselors, and we want to see a smooth transition for the students, and we believe these relocations will have a damaging effect on their social-emotional needs. Please reconsider the transfer of the counselors so they can continue to work with our students with whom they have relationships with. Okay, 
campaign, I'm not sure that there was an announcement that, um, that was Maggie Riley from the Proviso Teachers Union. Um, our next online comment comes from, is that Carissa Gillespie. Good evening, Board of Education. I'd like to say thank you to the BOE for uh, bringing more resources in regards to African American history into our schools. Um, I look forward to us also fleshing out our Hispanic and Latino history courses as well as our Asian American courses. Some of my concerns this evening. Each month, the list of administrative positions and salaries grows. It seems that the people that do the least amount of work with students get paid the most. Yet when it comes to paying those that are part of the community or touch and shape the <coughs> students the most, we pay the least. Not right. I'm especially disappointed in seeing the barely living wage salaries offered to the food service workers, especially since this was touted as jobs for the community. I would also like to ask the BOE and the superintendent to be more mindful and respectful when it comes to spending our education dollars, especially on things that do not concern students. For example, cupcakes, weekly dinner, chat and shoes, hotels and conference room rentals for retreats, consulting. If we are dead set on spending on these types of items, can we at least make these purchases with local vendors so that the money is brought back into our community. Also, Walker Services is offering a donation of $3,500 to the Board of Education for professional development for the Board of Education. Since Walker Consulting is consulting us on our food services, would it make better sense for that donation to be used for professional development resources for our culinary students, our future? We have lost over 30 plus employees, quality employees, to higher performance schools under this new reorganizational plan. My hope is that the community will get a chance to see how the superintendent's purge of some positions and creating of new ones will benefit our schools and students. Changes on the horizon has yet to materialize. We talked a lot about race over the past year and a half. The conversations and concerns need to be had. But please, let's stop using race to excuse bad decision making. If all the success of hiring and extravagant spending continues, then the failure of our schools won't lie on the majority white teaching staff that we use as a scapegoat. The failure of our schools and students will lie on the majority black and brown board, black and brown educational leaders who put their interests and their wants and needs ahead and on the backs of our black and brown students. We need to do better for our students. Thank you. Um, now we have our in-person comments. If uh, when I call your name, please come on up. Ms. Monica Angelo. Our next public comment comes from Ms. Rashonda Ford. Good evening, good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity um, to 
to address this issue. My name is Roshonda Ford, and my son is a senior at PMSA. He's been a member of the Proviso East Marching Band, Jazz Band, and Concert Band since his freshman year. That includes summer bands as well. He's enjoyed being in the band, and I've seen him apply the lessons that he's received from Mr. Seals, not only in music, but some things that he's learned has been applied to his everyday life. And yeah, he's looking forward to spending his senior year out in marching band. My concerns are, why isn't the Proviso East Marching Band being offered as a class to the returning Proviso East Marching Band students and is offered as a class at Proviso West? How would the marching band not being offered as a class affect any potential scholarships that, may, that the students may apply for? And not being a class, which includes zero period, will only leave after school practice for the kids, which could potentially interfere with their homework and much needed job situations for, fam for kids that help with their families financially. I just want to say, since the band has not been together in a while, a long while, it's time for us to help them rebuild and not give them any hindrances. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our next public comment comes from Ms. Jill Wagner. communication going on and sometimes that happens and it's okay to fix miscommunications but for the past three years kids that have been in the Proviso East marching band have been in the marching band because they have gone to their counselor and asked to be in marching band because it hasn't been on the menu to be in band so every kid in the Proviso East marching band has been recruited to be in marching band. So that's just been the way it's been at East for years. That's just part of the culture. So the past year, there hasn't been a student in school. It makes it hard to recruit kids to be in band. And then tonight I was thinking, how many kids at East are registered for school before the first day of school? I don't know. But I seem to remember that that seems to be kind of an issue at East, that there are a lot of students that don't register until the week of school. So it's hard to know how many students are interested in band when you have a small percentage of students that are actually registering for school, okay? I have a rule that I do not come to board meetings. And I'm breaking that rule tonight because it's important this is a really important issue. 95% of the kids who apply for scholarships that are in the marching band get them. This is a pathway to college. And I know everyone on that score cares a lot about school and cares a lot about the kids and cares a lot about their futures. And you can do anything you want. You can do anything you want, right? You can say early bird band for East, right? And then in four years, when you're scratching your head, trying to figure out why there are fewer kids going to college, the next board of education will say, well, maybe we should promote and help the classes that promote kids that go to college, right? And that's fine, really, however you want to do it. It's, it's, it's your jam. Um, I do think that this is gonna to come to a smooth landing. I think that this board of education tends to make good decisions. Sometimes they stumble and they right themselves. I do think that you tend to make overall good decisions. Um, I do hope that you will take the time to consider maybe 
keeping the in-person, in-class, during school marching band program available. Um, it takes a long time to learn an instrument. And the students that are coming in from our foundation schools don't always have the same skills available. And that's why Proviso East has an in-person, in-band program that has been stopped, basically, for the past year and a half. All right, God bless. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, was that the three-minute mark, or was that like a no, national three. weather or service okay. situation? <laughs> okay, we're going to need to change that. Okay, next speaker, we have uh, Ms. Jennifer Barbahan.
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Shannon Wood. I am a prospective parent for the 22-23 school year. Friday, July 30th, I saw a petition about the ban being canceled at East. On Saturday, July 31st, I decided that since I read about the situation on social media, that I would email Dr. Henderson and Mr. Alexander for clarification. I admit I did not include the whole board, and for that I apologize. Later that day, I received a response from Dr. Henderson that read, Thank you so very much, Mrs. Wood. You may contact me at, and he provided his phone number. I replied, Thank you for answering and providing me with your phone number. I prefer to have an explanation in email so there are no misunderstandings and just the facts. Things cannot be taken out of context. Dr. Henderson's next response was, I am driving and will be for several hours. You may contact me via phone or I will be in the office next week and you can stop by my office to address your concerns. I replied, I can be patient for you to write the email. I will also be attending Tuesday night as there is a scheduled board meeting for last Tuesday. The last communication with Dr. Henderson was, we will see you Tuesday night. My last follow-up was August 5th, in which I wrote, I am still waiting for clarification via email with what happened with the band situation. There has been no further communication. Mr. Alexander was copied on all of the emails and did not respond at all. On July 5th, an article was published in the Forest Park Review. Quote, he, Mr. Alexander, also lambasted Barbara Hutton's petition as misinformation and a waste of time. He said if Barbara had and other parents and community members wanted to know more information about the band's status, they could have called him on his cell. The public is being asked to have phone conversations. Things can be forgotten or misinterpreted through phone calls. It is also very easy for anyone on that call to go back and say, I never said that. Written communication is clear, concise, to the point, with facts. It protects all involved to make sure no mistruths are put out. If I had had an email response, I would have been able to help clear up what was considered mistruths on social media. Seems like a win-win to me. The second quote from Mr. Alexander, quote, I didn't say anything on Facebook but the facts, he said. She told her story. Her petition is based on untruths. You come down the street raggedy, I'm going to correct you. I did not curse. I did not call anyone out of their name. I made factual statements. That's in response to your untrue petitions and putting up false information and she has a problem with me, she doesn't even know me. <clears throat> as the board president, Mr. Alexander, you speak on behalf of the board as a whole. Again, you speak for all of your board members. Members, are you okay with how Mr. Alexander represents each and every one of you? No. I am not even a parent in this district yet and I feel shut out. I do not have any trust in 209 at the current moment. This can change. Be clear with communication. Reply to emails. Don't have off-the-record phone calls. This can come off as shady, which leads to mistrust. Mistrust is what has broken this district before. Let's not let that happen again. I'm almost done. When anyone on the board lashes out at the public in the way Mr. Alexander has been, the message given is that nobody's concerns matter. Mr. Alexander, I leave you tonight with something I came across today. You cannot be in leadership and be nasty to folks and expect to be respected because of your title. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next public comment comes from Ms. Maria Maxim. Henderson was mentioned by name several times 
for his role in the district's violation of 81% of state accreditation standards. And those were explained um, in almost 400 pages, which included, you know, a million dollars in questioned federal expenditures, a dysfunctional board of administration, improper spending, inaccurate record keeping, and many, many other things. You can read the report, it's online. If anyone wants to come up to me after the meeting, I can give you the link. Um, and again, he has mentioned Henderson by name for his con contribution to these deplorable conditions that have gotten his uh, district abolished. Earlier in 2020, the Mississippi State Auditor's Office, a different state board, released a report that found widespread, was the quote they used, um, problems under Henderson's tenure while he was there. So we have three state agencies. We have the Mississippi State Board of Education, we have the Mississippi State Auditor, and we have the Governor of Mississippi. All of them publicly coming out and finding severe problems, so severe now, in fact, that the entire district and board is being dismantled and taken over by the state. This is not a lie. Um, with our superintendent's name mentioned on that, I feel like it's come to the point where raises, new contracts, um, supportive resolutions, and continual praise are not going to erase the past, and they're not going to erase the facts. And it's troubling to me that this board, many of you who I campaigned for and with, I've knocked on hundreds of doors for a lot of you guys, I've voted, in, voted for you and I believe in you, just seem to be ignoring these facts that are out there and saying, well, that's where he was before, he's here now. Time's up, ma'am. I'm just going to read my last sentence. Uh, time's up, ma'am. It's not too late to make a change. Excuse me. Our students deserve the time's best. Time's up, ma'am. And this is not Time it. is up, ma'am. Thank you for your comments. Any more? No. Okay. President's report. Good evening, Proviso. Good evening, Mr. Alexander. Hold on one second, Ms. Patterson. Yeah, let me, let me do something real quick, guests. First, let me get me a piece of sugar. Ms. Patterson, you have the floor. Before we move, is, is this the whole Dr. Hall? Is it Dr. Mr. I'm confused because I didn't know that we didn't have a band. I didn't either. Is it possible for him to address? Since so, so this is what we're going to do, and we don't usually do this. Since so many have come with a concern for band, of the which we found out when the Facebook post went fit out and was sent out. We're going to get clarification from the principal for you. Okay, so we can get accurate information as to what's going on at East. The band director is here too, so we can... No, the principal's here, ma'am. Right. And he runs the school. So the principal would know better than the band leader. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank Good you. Good evening, Board of Education. Mr. Hall, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Board of Education and parents. Uh, it is a, you know, I'm sorry that uh, we're standing up here addressing this on the eve of school opening. Uh, we came in July 1st. Uh, me, Ms. McIntosh, and the remaining uh, administrators uh, of the team, Mr. Geary, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Caldwell, and Dr. Brennan. We started working on the schedule July 1st. When we started working on the schedule, we looked at the student tablets from all the classes, from the student selections that they did in the fall. And we started looking and plotting the classes up on the boards to see where to put the kids that, you know, into the classes that they selected back in December when they, when they, did, the, uh, when they did the selections. That's the process that happens in all high schools. It's done behind the scenes. And from there, we generate the student schedules and the teacher schedules. Ms. McIntosh came in, she started working on the board while I started working on staff, and she'll take it from here. So I want to make sure that we do, I'm sorry, good morning, good afternoon board. So my name is Latoya McIntosh and I'm one of the grade level principals. So when I came in, one of my tasks was to make sure I started working on the tallies for the new year. So as he said, students are given the opportunities by their counselors. Counselor goes in, they actually have a one-to-one -one meeting. This is not a group thing. Sit down with the counselor, the counselor tells them, Let's look at your transcript. Based upon the transcript, tells us what are the classes they're going to take for the following year. They do this in order to know what classes will be offered. 
there is a sheet that the students are given. The sheet is not blackened out where it takes off band or it takes off choir. It gives them an opportunity to pick everything. Band is on there, concert band, and also the marching band. So when these students put their names down, we do not force students into classrooms. We allow them the choice to pick. You can go back, you can look at our tallies. When we came in and we looked at the tallies, unfortunately, there are only four students. Four. Four students who picked marching band. So unfortunately, what happens is that people don't understand that you need a certain amount of students to, for a class to actually go. You cannot have a class with four students. So I will say this again. I came in July the 1st. So when I came in July the 1st, at this point, we're in the middle of summer. So if we're in the middle of summer, I don't have the opportunity to go back and say, students, there are only four students. Are there any, is there anyone else who wants to raise their hand and volunteer to be a part of the marching band? We're not going to force the kids into the marching band. When we noticed that, that there were only four students, I did talk to Mr. Seals. Mr. Seals has had four different conversations with me. I even emailed Mr. Seals, explained to Mr. Seals what a tally means and what's going on with the marching band. So he asked me, what does that mean by what is a tally? What do you mean about the marching band? I said, here's what's going to happen. The marching band does not have enough students in it, but you do have the option to actually offer it after school. You have 100% of our support. So what the parents are telling you, that is the truth when we say it, yes, the class can be offered after school, but not during the day. So marching band is not being offered, not because we decided to close it, he didn't have enough students for the class to run. So what ended up happening is, let me make sure I also make this, this point of clarification. Mr. Seals didn't even have enough students for him to have five sections. So five sections means five periods in the day. All of our teachers teach five periods. There wasn't even enough students in his tallies for him to have five periods. So when we think of that, we think like this. At a minimum, when you look at it, at the teacher's union, we cap our classes off at 27 students. So at a minimum, he needs about 27 students in the class to run. But because he's banned, he gets about 40. He didn't have 40. He had four. Those classes, you're more than welcome to still look at my tallies. They're still there. So those four students, we didn't collapse all of his classes. What I did was is that I helped Mr. Seals. I stretched him very, very thin to keep the band running. So with the band running, he is offered five sections. I'm not going to say what the five sections are because I don't know if I'm able to say that. But I can say them. So Mr. Seals does have concert band. He does have, he has choir band. So he still has these classes, but the marching band is not being offered. So the marching band is offered after school, but he still has concert band. He still has beginning band. I did also ask Mr. Steele's because he had a two and a half hour conversation with me in person. You will see it in the email where he asked, can he meet with me? I said, absolutely. He came up five minutes later. Two and a half hours we talked about it. I explained to him what tallies were. I explained to him why he only had this. My next suggestion to him was is that he needs to go out and actually create a plan where he comes back and lets me know, here's my plan, here's how I'm going to recruit. So he says, well, we had COVID going on. I said, I totally understand that. COVID would explain freshmen coming in. But if you had a, a marching band, where are my juniors and my seniors? Those are my returning students. So my returning students should still be in the marching band. They are not there. Because what's happening is, is that my students are at the point you have to remember. Marching band is an elective. If I didn't do well in my core classes, unfortunately, I have to drop marching band to take my core class so that I can graduate on time. So some of that stuff is happening to our students. So I want to make sure our parents understand that we're not getting rid of the band. It's still there. We gave him options. So he came with a problem. I gave him an option. He has a solution. Marching band is there, and I am a fan of the band. I want to make sure that's very well known. So we're here to support him. We don't want the marching band to go away. He gave me a problem. I gave him a solution. Unfortunately, he doesn't like the solution. I totally understand that. But right now, the best thing for him to do is, is for the parents and Mr. Seal to continue to work with me, even though I'm not over the band, I don't have a problem with it, to work with me, and we come up with some type of solution where he goes out and recruits. So right now, he cannot recruit during registration. So I want to make another point of clarification when it comes to registration. Students pick their classes in November, not in July. That is closed. That is how we find out how many teachers we need so that tells us if I need 100 teachers or if I need 50 based upon the numbers. We don't pick classes in July. That part of our session has closed, so it's not, it has nothing to do with registration. So a child picks their classes in November, 
Even though they're not registered, your classes are sitting there waiting for you. So it doesn't matter if you haven't registered or not. We're still going to take these babies. So even if you haven't registered, I have a class waiting for you because you told me in November what class you wanted, and when registration opens, which is five months later, that's when we do it. So if, you, if you've never come to the registration, when people walk in, your paperwork is already ready. We don't build the schedule in front of you. Your schedule is waiting for you. So I think that may be a little bit of misunderstanding with that part. Yes, sir. Thank you. Additionally. Uh, can I ask a question to that, though? Hold on. Let me finish, Ms. Medina, please. Uh, I have a question floor. for her before he, he before the next person starts. Please let him finish, and we'll give you the floor, ma'am. Just let him finish, because he may answer it. Yeah. Additionally, uh, as he was meeting with him, I met with Mr. Newhouse, Mr. New Church, who was the band assistant, and they were getting ready to start the band camp. And I was asking them, you know, what did participation look like? Did they work with the feeders? How many feeders, you know, of the kids that had band in the feeder schools actually were attending the camp or where we offered programs and invited those kids in, either before school or after school? so that they could just come into the band and get the numbers up. And, you know, I did, he did mention COVID, but it's like, well, what's the long-term relationship? Because if these are, these are the same feeder schools, then those kids, you know, we've been, we've been working with them and inviting them over and inviting them to the camps. Those kids would naturally just move into the band. And we've had several, several conversations with uh, Mr. New Church and the band director and I've been a part of them. She's had the bulk of them, but most of them are happening in my office as we're doing multiple things in there. And so these means are happening. And so, you know, uh, I know you have a question. Yeah. Okay. So usually, Proviso East has been notorious for having late registration and for us to, to get things, having to push things through last minute. So because of that, um, and, and being that this has been a historical class, is there no consideration into the history of the class and how it's been over time? Because I agree with, with, with the fact that we had COVID and um, participation has been really low, um, a historical class, especially one that brings as much pride as the marching band does, why would that, even, even if you have four, why wouldn't you keep that open with late registration? There's a lot of movement, and a lot of, movement, a, a lot of that movement has gone towards those those art programs historically. All right, so I don't think that she fully on I think it was 13 different yes. classes offered yes. for one teacher. It was 13 different classes offered. It was only 25 total talents out of all 13 of those classes. When she says she collapsed it, we talked about the classes that had the most talents, and those are the classes that carried. It could have, you know, one of them was beginning band, one of them was choir band, one of them was concert band, you know, so it was, it was multiple band classes. There was 13 classes offered. So are they each. offered every day? Because there's five? No, 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 no. The, on the course selection sheet, there was okay. 13 different selections. 13 different classes that the kids could choose from for his classes. The problem with 13 different selections is that there's only one teacher. And so, if we would have had if 27 kids or 25 kids would have signed up all those classes, then yeah, we went to the district and asked for another teacher so that we could carry those classes. When we are, they, at, are they every day or are they no, once a no. week? Or how, how does that, it's, it's obvious that he's been doing so this for years. So. What I'm essentially saying is that we offered too many classes, which watered down, it would have potentially watered down the selections of the kids and they would have been spread out over 13 classes when the, the, the band, beginning band, concert band were the classes that he selected and that he wanted. Those classes would have carried. Those kids would have been offered those and some of the classes that had traditionally given tally should have been taken off of the selection sheet. Okay, but before you present those classes, don't the teachers know what their classes are? If there's 13 are, if there's 13 offerings for band, shall we say? Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't the teachers know that ahead of time? Is, isn't that isn't there a reason or there's a, a dynamic that's being built with one being like a beginner's band and then they go to a, a, a further and then there's mentoring and these classes, um, you know, stagger one on top of the other? Is it, isn't isn't there a component? Because that's how music develops work. I'm a musician. Yeah, I mean he's aware of what classes were offered. 
I just don't know if they were prioritizing what what the kids were going to select or what he was going to carry in his courses. I don't know what his cor his uh, previous courses looked like. I, if I could, if we could just, okay. if we could just skip to the end result. Um, what classes are being offered? What band classes are being offered for credit this semester at Proviso East? So for band, he has concert band, and then he has um, beginning band. But he's also teaching choir because, as I stated before, he didn't have enough classes to just be a band teacher only. So because he didn't have enough students to sign up for band, he ended up having to teach choir also. So he's going to teach choir, and he's going to teach concert band and beginning band also. Okay. Okay. I have one question. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Patterson, then we got to move on. No, no, go on, finish. I'm sorry. No. Go, go no, Amanda ahead. wasn't done. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, just because there's confusion, the class is happening, the class isn't happening, what's happening with the classes, I just, we have a group of band parents here, some of whom are incoming, or parents of incoming freshmen, and they're wondering if their son, especially, is going to get to do his thing. You know, like, and I understand that one thing, when your kid has one thing, you, you want them to hang on to that one thing. Yeah. So we have some classes where so, bands being taught for credit. Is there a possibility that the second semester we can open up more classes yeah, so to more, band students? To, to answer the questions, most of the tallies that we got were for us from incoming freshmen. Mm -hmm. So the kids did sign up for band. I'm not sure which one they signed up for, but I'm sure that those those the tallies from the kids are reflected from the kids. Mm -hmm. My only other comment that I would make is that being as you did come in kind of new, Ms. Washington, this is your, you know, you're the first time being in administration at East, right? At East. At East, right. Not your first time in administration, but your first time at East. Um, you're new here at East. You came in July 1st. Summer's half over. Classes have been decided, right? Like the November prior. Would it have made sense to look at class rosters and registrations from 2019? to get a sense of how popular band is at Proviso East. Yeah, we did look at that. Okay. The numbers were low in. Okay, so this is, all right, so then we have the hashtags and the tallies and I get that. And here, I just want to make sure, we have some offerings, so incoming freshmen or people who want to take other classes can take some kind of, some form of band at East. Yeah, we're, we're, the classes are totally there. Any kid there requested, had an opportunity to sign up. If a kid that hasn't registered comes in, and you know, we've had heavy registration in the first two days mm -hmm. of this week, uh, if they signed up for it, we'll put them in there. Okay. It's not, I mean, it's not like. We, go ahead, Ms. Patterson. We've got so, uh, I have a question to you, Mr. But, President. Um, in reference, so what I'm hearing is we, one, we do have a band. Because when, yeah. when I heard we don't have a band, that's not true. We not have true. a band, we don't have early bird band, right? We don't have continuing students that continue to and with the early bird. And that was my concern because mm -hmm. I believe the instructor, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've heard pandemic a few times, but did he not have communication with his kids, his students during the pandemic? He may have kept in music over. Did, did he not have uh, right. communication? So was he working every day and not communicate with the students? I'm, he was working. Uh, I don't know what his communication So my, my question then is, well, the, the point that I'm trying to make, you had sophomores, you had juniors, and you had seniors. That's your group that was already a part of Early Bird. And am I hearing you say those students didn't even sign up? Okay. Which, another point I'm going to make, if he was communicating with his students every day because school was remote and you still needed to communicate with your students, at that point, that should have been pushed. You guys, um, back in December, uh, when the courses were being picked, don't forget, you need to sign up for early bird. Um, I remember a point in time, there was no early bird. Everything was done after school. And practice after school. Then they moved when they had uh, early bird. But when I hear pandemic, the teacher should have been communicating with the students during the pandemic, saying, hey, make sure you guys sign up. I can understand the freshman parents, 
but a sophomore, junior, and senior that was already a part of it and didn't sign up, that's concerning. I mean, all right. So um, I guess I'm going to, I'm wearing two hats right now. Right? I'm a board member and I'm also a former marching band parent. And um, so, and I watched, you know, my son really struggle through the pandemic in relation to marching band, which was the, really the only thing he cared about in school. His marching band. The rest of it he really couldn't give a crap about. And it was so demoralizing to try and do marching band over a computer that he really that he deeply lost faith in the marching band. And I don't think he was alone in that. And I also firsthand witnessed Mr. Seals reaching out to his kids through all sorts of social media, and he gets it's, it's crickets with his kids. With, I don't know if it's, a mar if it's a marching band kid mentality, or if it's just a kid mentality. They really struggle with their communication. And I would really hope that if a bunch of kids show up during registration and say, I want to be a marching band, that we would do something about that, because I think that we're facing an extraordinary circumstance. Yes. And Proviso East is a fantastic school and has many redeeming programs. But the Proviso East Marketing Band has been a mainstay, it's been one of the only programs that has consistently sustained excellence. And I think that I just really would like Proviso East to keep an open mind and support these kids because if they come out of the woodwork, they wait a second, I do want to be a marching band, yeah. that we would support that very strongly. Yeah. I agree. I would say, I agree. thank you guys. I agree. Just, I just, I agree. We've got to move on. You had I'm sorry. I won't. I, I won't. Go ahead, Ms. Medina, but we've got to move on. Go, That's go, fine. go, go, go. I would Please also say, worse. and I want to reiterate, marching band is something historic in Proviso East, which brings a great sense of pride. And by canceling the, pro the class, or not having the offering, what could happen is that the kids will, will uh, the, the, the program could just fall apart, and it would be really hard to rebuild it. So I, I would just take that into consideration. I want to be clear, Rodney. They never said they didn't offer it. The program was offered. It just wasn't chosen by the kids. And, it, it, let's, say it's let's not a, and, and thank it's you, Mr. Hall. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ms. Watson. Listen, here's where here's where the, the stuff gets lost in translation. We just had the professionals explain to us what happened, and we still have board members saying we canceled something. <laughs> I don't, this is, this is just very upsetting to me because we just took the time to go out of the agenda and the decorum to provide you all with the truth. We don't do this for community comments, folks. We don't address, you'll get a letter from the administration letter. But since you came out in this storm, we let the principal come up and explain to you the exact process. And we're still getting misinformation put out. We didn't cancel anything. And this is what I said on Facebook. It's false. This board did not do that. And the petition said we did. I haven't been on Facebook. Excuse me, I'm not talking to you, ma'am. I'm not addressing anyone in particular. I'm addressing what has just transpired here. So we're not going to go back and forth like this. Thank you. I'm just explaining what you guys just saw. We just allowed, because you came out with a concern for the principal to explain to you and the person responsible for the classes to explain what happened. And you still hear this word, canceling, when that did not happen. And we didn't cancel it. Students did not choose it. So you can't teach what's not there. And that was explained. If the students come, then I'm sure we will offer the class. Because we didn't cancel it in the first place. The kids will not Ms. Medina, the class. I have the floor. I'm not going back and forth with you. I gave you the floor. Please show me the same respect. Thank you. This is the president's report right now. We're done with that subject. We have a meeting to contend with. Oh my goodness, Miss Kelly, of course you can say something. No, I just want to say, I'm a pirate for life. And um, I, uh, I graduated from Proviso East. I love the band. Even when teachers went on strike, I went with the band down to Jackson State to Chaperone. 
So, I mean, anything that I can do for the band, I'm here to do it for the band. And we will not, we will not be disbanding the band. No, we haven't done that. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. President's report, thank you, guys. And thank you for explaining. Um, I'm going to make this quick. If um, I, I stay off of Facebook. I'm sorry, for yes. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm on this combobulated FOIA report. Let's go. Huh? I was going to go. Let me, let me, we can just do it afterwards. It doesn't. Yeah, we can switch yeah. everything else. Okay, that's fine. A FOIA report? Okay. In July 2021, Proviso Township to High School District 209 received the following FOIA requests. July 6, 2021, Dakota Stark requested copies of the current copier contract. Information was provided. July 9, 2021, Carrie Arnold requested copies of employee com compensation information for the 2020-2021 school year, including salary, title, and location, years of employment, school year 2020-2021, and school year 2021-2022 salary schedules with a minimum, midpoint, and maximum for all administrative, management, teaching, and leadership positions, pay policy documents or procedures governing employee compensation, employee benefit summary plan descriptions for medical, dental, and vision plans, including a breakdown of the amount of employee versus employer or contributions for the 2020-2021 school year. Information will be provided. And on July 20th, 2021, Avery Daniels requested copies of administrative contracts for the following administrators hired for the 2021-2022 school year. Leonard Moody, Finance Department, Cyrus McInnes, <coughs> Athletics, Kisha Wang, Grade Level Principal at West, Michael Pritchard, Director of IT. Um, I notice this does not say information will be provided. Is that information will be provided, Mr. Gleason? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. There's another FOIA that was not added. I asked I FOIA uh, information on graduation Excuse requirements. Me. Excuse me. Excuse and it was me, not Medina. included again Excuse in the report. So this, this is what we're going to do. The third do. time that I put in a FOIA and it is not included. So this in is the what report. we're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. President's report. Thank you all for coming out on this thunderous evening. Let me first say, as as the president and, and spokesperson of the board, I don't take that lightly. If I offended anyone in the media through my comments on Facebook, I, I humbly apologize for that. That's never my intention. I'm your servant. I'm here to serve you. A lot gets lost in translation on Facebook, and you'll never see me commenting on that thing. Facebook's the devil to me because you don't get to really express your concern and discontent. That was sent to me by a mayor, that petition, on a Saturday evening. And when I read it, I immediately contacted Dr. Henderson to see if it was true. Once my one employee tells me it's not, then that's what I'm going to tell you. And as you've seen this evening, it's not true. This board has not canceled anything, nor would we cancel anything. And if you understand anything about this board that you elected, we're adding to students' experiences. So if there's a misconception or a misunderstanding, this board, as I stated on the Facebook page, can, can, I can be reached directly by phone. I take issue, as most board members would, with the amount of work we do being told how I have to communicate with 7,800 plus people that I volunteer for. I do have a job and I do have a family. So it's a preferable way for me to pick up the phone and talk to people. I'm not sitting in front of a computer any day of my life and I do a lot of driving on my day job, so I cannot do that, I'm sorry. But I will talk to you till the ears fall off. You can record me, you can do whatever you want to. I'm a man of my word. Everything that I said to Michael Romaine, I meant I'm never off the record when I talk to him. Everything I say, whenever he calls me, including today, I'm always on the record because I mean what I say and I say what I mean. So I'm a man of my word. So if I tell you it's not true, you can take that to the bank because it's not true. There's a misunderstanding. We need to get to the bottom of it. But signing a petition and making false accusations and getting people riled up is not the responsible way in my purview to do that. Not when your board members have their phone numbers on their card. And some of those people on that thing, you heard me get the, you guys could have just called me. You didn't have to take and do all of this. You could have gotten to the bottom of it, that's all. My concern was for your time and the information that was being put out there because as we learned this evening, it was not true. It just wasn't. And this board has not canceled any classes in the four years that I've been on it. We've not taken anything from students in the four years that I've been on it. We've made strides to make sure that there's money and additions to the students since this board has been active up here for the six plus years. 
everything from books to computers, that's what this board has done and that's what we stand for. So it's kind of almost personal to be attacked that way to say that we would cancel or take something from students. We, we, there's no record of that. You won't find it in six years with this board. We've never done that. We've made strides to make sure, at the expense of other things possibly, that everything's available for the students. I want to thank the board for the privilege and the honor of serving. But I definitely want to thank the community. Don't think, even when we disagree, that you're not heard. We work for you. And it's very important that the community understands how we sit up here. So none of us sit up here with a, with a, with a big head or anything. No, this is work. Folks, this is a lot of work. We do not get paid, regardless of what you think. And if you think a, a, a thing of candy and a meal once a month is enough for the work that we have to do to make sure that your students get the best education, our students, my son just registered yesterday, he will be a freshman, so it's personal to me now too. We're parents just like you. We're taxpayers just like you. I'm not running for anything else, and as far as I know, no one up here has any other political aspirations. I know these folks pretty well. We are all here to serve you. So all I ask for is just the benefit of the doubt and the trust based upon our record, not based upon campaign promises. Look at the record of what this board has done for this district and judge us on that because we've earned that respect, I believe. I will speak up for my board seven days a week, twice on Sunday. We've earned that. We've earned that respect, I believe, from the community. Thank you to the board. These are some of the six hardest working people I've ever known in my life, and I thought I knew service through my fraternity, and I thought I knew service through, through religion and other aspects in my life, but I, I, I've learned a totally new respect. Ned Wagner has a family and works and serves a vulnerable population. Incredible hours he puts in. Incredible hours. Uh, he's a first responder type guy. Um, front lines, putting his health and safety and that of his family on the line. And every time this school district needs something, he's here. He's here. Sam has been advocating in the community way before I was even a member in it. Well known, well respected. You got an issue in Melrose or any of these towns, you call Sam Valtier as he's on it. He's been doing this way before here. He has a family, sons, wife, job, long hours. Delicate work Sam does. He's got to be on top of it or he can hurt himself or die. But you call Sam for the last four years, he's here as if he's getting paid, putting that same energy into making sure every child in this district gets the best education that they can. Claudia Medina works tirelessly to educate children out of her home advocating for students, fighting the good fight, 24-7, working her tail off. We don't hardly ever agree, but she's dedicated to whatever cause she feels that she's fighting. Medical issues, family, all of these things that's still serving this community. She's not getting paid either. Amanda Grant, newlywed on family. Man, she feeds more people in this district than a little bit and is passionate about it. Busting her tail to make sure that those less fortunate can get food and the things that they need to sustain themselves. But I tell you what, you got a question about finance on this board? Amanda Grant has the answer. Not only does she balance her own checkbook, she makes sure that the districts are balanced too and stays on top of it, almost painfully so, to make sure that the activities that were going on before we got elected no longer go on. This stuff takes time, people. This stuff takes dedication, and we're not getting paid for it. Della Patterson has been attending board members' meetings for 30 years. Before her children were here, after they were gone. She's been advocating for students in this district for just as long, making sure that there was equity. From what I understand, because I wasn't here, sometimes being that lone voice on that side of the map, telling the board what you guys are telling us tonight. 
all of that dedication and knowledge and information she shares with us now. She's not getting paid. And of course, Ms. Kelly, the longest standing board member, the reason that we're all up here, 22 years of service. I, I, I don't think you guys understand. She's done this for 22 years for free. I just made 20 years on my job. I'm looking for a pension. <laughs> She's not getting one. Y'all don't hear me. This woman has dedicated 22 years of her life so that you could finally start to see the changes that you're seeing right now. So I just wanted you to know that about the board that I am blessed to be the president of. Just a little tidbit about who these people are up here and what we represent. So when these things are being said, you can advocate for us. You can say, no, that's not them. And if there is a misunderstanding, if there is something we get wrong, we're human, we'll all apologize. But we're trying to do the right thing. And our record speaks for itself. So far, we've done pretty doggone good. So far, we've done pretty doggone good. Dr. Henderson, your team continues to amaze me. Since the fall, we had a historic graduation. Uh, the drive through graduations were just impeccable. They were incredible. I think I read the letter last month, brought tears to my eyes at the parents sent me, saying how it just really warmed her heart and that it was personal, even more personal, given the restraints of COVID. We still managed to come up with a graduation ceremony that was memorable, to say the least. Summer school started without a hitch. Students were able to get in there. My son attended summer school for the first time, and I'm telling you, with freshmen, 14-year-old boys, you're just kind of throwing stuff up against the wall right now to see what sticks. You know, try to get them off the video games, trying to find something. He came up here every day religiously for two hours and wanted to come for the STEM program, was engaged. And that's a tall order to get somebody who I can't get to be focused too much on anything. But thank you to the administration for that that experience. And I heard from several parents saying the same thing. Summer school was beautiful. You pulled off an administrative retreat after restructuring all of these things, then turned around and had a board retreat. Two town hall meetings. <laughs> Ongoing contractual work and, and, and construction in the district. Saving us all kinds of money. Adding classes and curriculum I won't say why we won't have the eighth period day this year. I don't think I can say that, Mr. Gleason. Can I? Please don't. I, I can't say why, which is another impediment to some other things that we discussed tonight, but I can't say that. But we're working to add to our students and our scholars. Remember I said, folks, I have no political aspirations. I will only be president for a few more months and then I must move back to my corner. Somebody else will sit here and have the joyful burden of being having their names called and, mis and mischaracterized. We do this because we love our township. We do this because we believe that we want better for our students and that you do too. That's the only reason. And we do it because we believe and know that it can be done. We know it can be done and that's why we're doing it. It's not a maybe, it's not an if. It's not we're trying. No, we're doing it. We are doing it. And that's evident in the record of this board. And I just wish somebody would do a Facebook post on that and talk about all of our... We haven't even had any losses. We haven't had any losses. We got, the, the, all the stuff that we usually get in the newspaper is fabricated, innuendos, lies. Folks want to talk about something that happened in a whole other state. Nothing real. It's real. Nothing real. Yeah. Nothing that's happened here. But we have all these wins. We have all these beautiful things for Proviso Township High School, and nobody wants to talk about that. It's crazy. It's like the more you do, <laughs> the more people just don't want to believe it. I, maybe it's deficit mind thinking, I don't know. Um, but I will tell you guys this before I close. I've said this before, and, and it just amazes me how sometimes, as adults, we don't get it. The killing in the streets and all of the craziness we see going on in the world is the failure of adults. It's the failure of adults to raise their children. Because those students and those uh, children running around here doing all this heinous stuff, at one time were in somebody's classroom. Mm -hmm. They came out of somebody's womb. And guess what, folks? They didn't even ask to come here. So if they're doing what they're doing now, that means somewhere between coming out of the womb and getting to where they are right now and making those choices, someone failed them. 
I don't know who that was. I don't know how it was. I just happen to know that after a certain point of time, the society doesn't care anymore. You're going to jail or worse because you're an adult. But the choices, the processes, the things that should have been put in place for them, obviously were not. And now we see the harvest. 49 shootings last weekend. A, a, a young female police officer just lost her life a, a, a night ago. Mm -hmm. And from what I saw of the pictures, these were three young adults that are responsible. They were once in someone's classroom. They come from someone's home. What I'm saying to you, Proviso, is that if we don't get this right, that will be our failure, and those responsibilities will be ours. Just like the failures of the generation, which I like to call mine, because these kids are old enough to be mine. That's, that's our harvest for failing to do what we were supposed to do. Make no bones about it. You plant apple seeds, you're getting apple tree. Mm -hmm. You ain't getting oranges. Plant apple seeds, you get an apple tree. You ain't getting oranges. You want oranges, you got to cut the tree down, retail the soil, get it all ready, and plant some orange <coughs> seeds. So it provides that we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Dr. Henderson, to get it right, mm -hmm. to make sure that our children are really educated, that there are no such thing as alternative facts, and that we're not arguing with adults over mm -hmm. fake news and issues that we really shouldn't be arguing over that have nothing to do with children. The, the issues that do, we definitely want to take those up. But the issues that don't, we're wasting time if we do. We're wasting time, and it's not our time anymore. We've had ours. We're wasting the time of the scholars and the students. So I call upon the community to do their part. Parents, make sure your students are registered, if at all possible, on time. Make sure that they're prepared the first day of school. We have services and, and, and plenty of things available. If there's obstacles and barriers there for you. But we do know the first couple of days of school, especially the first day, is very important. Please make sure our scholars are in the classroom. We're making sure that the, that the hallways are safe and the plan will be presented tonight is about how we're going to bring all that stuff to fruition. We just need the parents to do their part, the caregivers to do their part. We can't come to your door, unfortunately, and, and make sure your kid is up. We can't do that. We need them here so that we can do our part. And trust and believe, if we get them here, we got the rest of it. But in as much as you're going to send them to us, I'm going to ask you one more thing. And I believe Dr. Henderson knows this, and he means it from the bottom of his heart, too. You send those children to us, you send our children to us, I promise you we'll take care of them. I promise you that they will get the best education that we can give them. We will no longer accept anything less. We're not playing the numbers game anymore. We're not just saying things to make you feel good while you come home wondering why your child still can't read or still can't do. No, we're not doing that anymore in Proviso. We're telling the unadulterated truth, and we're holding people accountable, even us as a board. So we just ask for your support and your help in that, because we're going to need it. We're going to need it. And as we do this thing of rebuilding or restoring proviso, let's reinvent the way we communicate with each other, because that's important. We're parents. We're community members. I am not a politician. I'm sorry. It is very hard for me to take darts. I can take them. I'm a tough guy, five years of infantry, whatever. But it's very hard when I know somebody can just pick up the phone and have an intelligent conversation with me. It's very hard when you're misaligned. And nobody here wants their name on Facebook or in social media being drugged through the mud. That doesn't have to be acceptable politics and proviso anymore. That doesn't have to be that way. That's a choice that we choose to make in how we deal with each other. And I apologize once again if I have offended anyone on social media or in the media, I just call it like it is. But I'm a servant. I am busting my tail like the rest of these board members up here to deliver the best product to you all for the votes and the trust that you've put in us. And we're doing that seven days a week. Seven days a week, folks. All right? I can't talk about the eight period day, Mr. Gleason. Um, thank you once again, board, for your continued support. I think I've said enough. Dr. Henderson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. All aboard! Choo -choo -choo. All aboard! All aboard. All aboard. All aboard.
That, that sounds like you guys are on, all, on board tonight. Let's try that again. All aboard! All aboard! All aboard. Let's go. You know, one of my favorite authors penned this to paper. You may write in history with all your bitter and twisted lies, but still, like dust, I rise. And that's what we're going to do. Yes, sir. All aboard! All aboard! We will rise in spite of yes, sir. what is happening. We have no other choice. That's right. Because it's not about us. It's about children. Yeah. And we're going to make sure we're doing that which is in the best interest of all children. <clears throat> so with that being said, presentation. Where are you? Let's get started. All right. Good evening, members of the board. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, evening, members of the community. My name is Leonard Moody. I'm the coordinator for accounting and finance, and I am here uh, to present to you the tentative fiscal year 22 budget for the district. Uh, what I'm going to share with you tonight is a summary of the document that you have um, in the board actions. So with that, we'll get right to it. I uh, hope I'm okay. You're seeing the same thing I am. On the screen, you will see a history of our revenues going back a number of years. Just want to give you some perspective on sort of where we are and where we're going. Uh, you can see the revenues have grown over time, uh, pretty much in line with the cost of living uh, increases. Uh, you see, I've added here fiscal year 21, those are unaudited numbers. But fiscal year 21 uh, pretty much uh, works in sync with the years prior. And if you look at what we projected for fiscal year 22, you see that it's in quite a bit higher. And I just want to explain why that is. Um, if you look at the, the items that are in blue, you notice that those are pretty consistent until you get to fiscal year 22. You see the, the amount of blue increases. And that's because those are federal dollars, and that's a substantial increase because of the ESSER uh, stimulus package that was passed. Um, we're getting a share of that. So in this slide, you have the actual raw numbers. I know a lot of people like numbers. I like to see the numbers. And you can see here that our local sources have grown uh, pretty much in line with the cost of living. There's some normal variations from year to year. Uh, we're projecting for, for the local sources of revenue that it's going to be fairly consistent with what you've seen in the past. Uh, same thing for the state sources, but for the federal sources, you see a large increase. We're going to go from $7 million in fiscal year 21 to, we're well, projecting $23 million and some change for fiscal year 22, and $18 million of that is a result of the ESSER II and ESSER III funds. Just some notes from the revenues. Uh, we project revenues conservatively. We try to, try to make sure that we don't overestimate what we think we're going to get. So we try to be conservative about that. Uh, this, this projection, it preserves healthy fund balances. We'll also be able to maintain the financial profile rating that we receive from the state. And it takes full advantage of those stimulus funds. Now we're using um, grants in a new way. It's one of the things that we're trying to do differently. We are actively managing those grants to support the new instructional framework. So grade level principles and coaching, those are things that can be supported through grants. And that makes sure that we keep our local dollars available uh, for whatever we need them for. There are less strings attached to those. Also, actively managing the grants, we can use those funds to support 
uh, the addition of an equity officer. And so we don't have to use local funds for that, that new initiative. So we're, 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 we're stretching these revenue dollars. Right now, I want to take a look at expenses. And so you can see the history of expenses over the last several years. And you can see that expenses have also generally grown um, in relation to the cost of living. I've got the 2021 unaudited numbers here uh, for you to see. And then I've also got the 2022 projected numbers. And as you can see, in 2022, there is a, uh, a, a large increase in the green area. That green area represents the investment that the district is making in the FMP. Looking at the raw numbers, this gives you an idea of how significant that investment is. You can see that in the past, we we're in the 80s and 90s, growing slowly, but in 2021, there's a big increase. We jumped from 100 million a year in expense to 113. And you can see that for the capital projects, fund 60 went from 8 million to 29 million in 2021. That increase, again, is the investment in the FMP, and we need to continue that. So if you look at fiscal year 22, the projection, we plan to go up to $129 million in expenses. Fully 30 million of that will be to support the FMP. Here's some notes from the expenses. One of the things we do with the expenses, we try to make sure that we leave room for growth. Uh, we don't want to box ourselves in too tightly if we don't have to. But it includes an unprecedented investment in facilities. And so that's why you see the difference from year to year. Now, it's partially supported by those ESSER funds. We can't use all of the ESSER funds specifically for construction, but we can use a, a big, significant chunk of those ESSER funds to support the construction. This budget also provides funds for a full return, uh, I'm sorry, for a return to full operations as we uh, recover from COVID. And we're trying to accomplish nothing but the best with this budget. And so in doing so, we are bringing some services in-house in order to provide better service and to provide employment opportunities for the community. And goal five of the strategic plan relates to financial health and strategic resource allocation. And so <coughs> we want to make sure we're being efficient, we want to make sure we're being effective. And as a result, we are actively managing our expenses um, to a higher level than we've done in the past. So we are going to maximize the impact of our grants. We're going to audit our health benefits, make sure we're not uh, leaking money there, and we're going to audit our utility bills to, again, also make sure that we're not leaking funds. What's our fund balance going to be? I'm glad you asked that. So this slide will show you where we are in terms of fund balance and where we expect to be. So you can see 2012, it was quite a bit lower, and it's been growing over the years. Uh, went up a, a good deal in 2019, but after that, we made a decision that we want to invest in the facility. And so you can see that since 2019, our fund balance, we've taken it down a bit. So it's going to be a little lower. I'm projecting a, a little bit of a lower fund balance in fiscal 22 because of the investment in the FNP. But isn't um, the fund balance that we maintain indicative of what our financial rating is be? It will. It does. And I think in this next slide, you'll see that even though we're projecting a lower fund balance, there's a good reason for that. There's a rational uh, financial reason for that, and that in spite of that, our fund balance is still very healthy. The board instituted a, a policy that required the fund balance remain above 33% of expenses, and even taking the balance down to support the FNP, we will still be well above that mark. So we are healthy, and we will be healthy even after um, making these decisions. So 
Our financial profile, our rank right now is a four. That's the, the best you can get from the state. We will continue to have a four. So that's the good news. Even though we're taking the balance down, we're still in a good position. And this budget advances the strategic goals of the district, which is improving our facilities, improving our, the services we're providing the students. I just want to give you a sense of the process, what the next steps look like. Um, hopefully, if I can get your approval for, for the tentative budget, um, the state requires that it be on display for 30 days, so we're going to do that. Uh, but what also typically happens in school districts is you take that 30 days to refine the budget. So we're going to continue uh, to sharpen our numbers. We're going to continue to sculpt it. And in 30 days, we at the next board meeting, we will present to you the final budget. And hopefully we get your approval at that time. There will be a public hearing. And the, the budget will be finalized and approved, and it will go into effect. So that really concludes my presentation. I just wanted to ask if there are any questions. Yes, yeah, so are you going to be providing a five-year financial with, so we can see where we're going to go? Because just going to 22 is a little short-sighted. We need to see what's going to happen beyond that. I don't have a problem with that, and okay. certainly that's something we could consider for the, um, um, the final budget presentation next month. Can I just jump back to point out, this is just to, to clarify, so you that that slide about how our, so our fund balances increased dramatically because we were uh, intentionally accumulating funds for our facility master plan, and now our fund balances are starting to go down because we are intentionally spending the money we collected for construction because we're actually doing the construction. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's right. intentional. It's intentional. And we're staying above our 32%. Right. You saved for it, now we're spending it. Now we're spending it. Excellent. On behalf of children. And I remember that um, the fund balance was increased by 10 million. Yeah. 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 Yeah
and air filtering because the Delta variant is incredibly aggressive and it is impacting uh, students. Is there anything in, in the F of allocations towards starting to put air filters into the classroom? Since many of the buildings don't have the ab availability to open their windows, especially when you know climate is inclement, do we have any of that money being allocated so, to those type of, of um, things which it was supposed to be? Yes, we're working on that right now. And you'll hear about it in a few minutes. So we're putting our filters in for the teachers and for the students. You'll hear about it in a few minutes. Hey, the next the presentation. Presentation. Yes or no? He's about to give the presentation, Ms. Medina. He just said he to tell you in a minute. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lillian. Mm. Thank you. And, well, I think tonight I need to seek your approval um, for the tentative budget and the next slide. And, uh, yeah, that's actually in the consent agenda. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Now we'll have uh, teaching and learning. Dr. Brown. Yes, sir. Oh, before we move on, can I just ask about um, the credit card? The only time that we can ask about this. Not, not right now. You cannot. Yeah, because this is the bill. This is the only time during the financial, so we can ask. They ask for questions. This is curriculum. This is a curriculum. It's before curriculum instruction. Before we move on to the next topic. You can ask about anything relative to bills when we do the consent agenda and get to the bill list, Ms. Medina. No, that's not any questions. It's prior to us. Ms. Medina. Okay, so no, you cannot have the floor. Okay, you can ask your question when we get to the consent agenda, and we have to run on the bill list. If you have anything relative to bills for the district, it's dealt with under the bill list on the consent agenda. We're not at that part of the agenda right now. We're in the superintendent's we ask, report. We've never asked questions there, so you're going to. We, you're, we, we, usually, we always ask questions now. We're not if dealing with. Us, we have to do questions. Ms. Medina. Thank you. He hasn't asked us. No. I know he's new, so he doesn't know. This is why I bring it to attention so we can speak about it. Ms. Medina. No. Okay. Mr. Brown, you have the floor. To President Alexander, Board of Education, to my colleagues and community, first of all, I'd like for the academic department of uh, the educational service department to stand to be recognized for this great work that I'm about to present. So the coordinators, um, the executive directors, special education, ELL, thank you. Thank you. So we have been charged. I'm, I'm very, very excited about the work that we're doing here at Proviso. Um, it, we, have, we have been charged with creating an instructional framework an academic plan that includes DL students, EL students, special education students, uh, diverse learners, um, e English language learners, general education, gifted and talented. And the co my colleagues are doing a great job of creating the instructional framework. And the instructional framework that we have been, we have had here at Proviso has been here for about 12 years. And um, we know the importance of instructional framework and we have seen glimpses or we've seen the strategic plan and we wanna make sure that the strategic plan becomes the reality, especially in the areas of mathematics and English language arts and reading, college and career readiness, and especially for all of our students, but especially for our students of color who tends to uh, graduate from high school with an achievement gap that lasts four years behind white students. That's a yucky, and that's a concern. So we have been charged to make sure that we put an instructional framework together that includes high impact instructional strategies that improve outcomes. We want students to lead this year's school having increased by one year of academics. We do not want students to leave and, and have only risen by two months or 60 days, even though they've been in school for 188 days. So that's why we have been intentional to create this, this instructional framework. This is why we have been intentional to not select just any instructional strategies, but proven research strategies that work. I have had the opportunity to share with the board 
a picture or a graph of the instructional framework that we continue to work on. This is our instructional framework for Proviso. It's been tailored for Proviso Township. An instructional framework will be short. An instructional framework provides a cohesive, together, structure made up of proven components, but is adaptable to work with varying teaching styles, content areas, and student needs. Here we go. When we lack an instructional framework and we have students at the core, it's a disservice. We're not doing what is best for students. We're leaving it up to guessing and operating on luck. And we should not be operating on luck. We should be intentional in our actions. When a school lacks an instructional framework, teachers are left to figure out things on their own. Select among a host of instructional strategies, but may not be strong instructional strategies. So we are being intentional to include in our framework, or in the Proviso Township framework, or instructional framework, high impact, high leverage instructional strategies. Here is another example, or here is the example, I guess, of the framework. We have teachers, professional communities, learning on the outside. In the middle, we have student achievement. We have assessment. Yes, we want to assess because the knowledge that's in the student's head, we can't see. So we give assessment so we can see what they know, what they don't know, what they partially know, and we behave accordingly. Teachers, uh, students, parents, um, administrators. We want to make sure that the curriculum is culturally relevant. We want to be concerned about students' social emotional needs as well as faculty and staff. So this is not just limited to our students, but this is for all of, all of, all of a, pro a proviso. <clears throat> so this is the instructional or the academic plan that we continue to create and we will say that it will be done by August 18th. So we can share it with our faculty and staff <clears throat> throughout the proviso. I have also been working with the school principals. Why? For the purpose of creating cohesive and the same template for the school improvement plan. We do not want Proviso doing their own thing. We do not want PMSA doing their own thing. It is essential for all of us to be operating the same and that meaning as it relates to the instructional framework. This does not mean that we're taking away the school's autonomy, but whenever we are working with our students, we want to make sure that we are providing them with the best sound research instructional strategies. The deputy superintendent meets with principals once a week, coordinators, executive directors. What's the purpose of this? For alignment, to ensure that the work that we're doing is intentional, to ensure that the, the intentional work is aligned to the strategic plan. By doing so, it increases the likelihood that what the Board of Education, the superintendent, and the community has set in the strategic plan will become a reality. Also, from teaching and learning, and I think this may be my last slide, the work continues. We are continuing to work on and review our approved curriculum projects. We're planning the District Institute, um, and it's going to be an outstanding District Institute, and this District Institute is also aligned to the strategic plan. The work that we do must be aligned to the strategic plan in order for it to become a reality. Teachers uh, completed their training for using the Black History 365 resource support of the Black History course. Again, thank you for my opportunity to stand before you to express the wonderful things that are happening in the academic department. I am not done. I am going to ask Dr. Kathy Rashard Andrews to come forward to continue with um, our presentation regarding the outstanding work that is happening here in Proviso Township. Good evening, members of the board. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening. Dr. Henderson, parents, and community members, as well as my colleagues. I'm Kathy Richard Andrews, and I am the Executive Director of Student Services and Equity. I want to begin by saying that COVID has had a major effect upon our children. The research that I have engaged in has shown that 
80% of high school students have said that COVID has had a direct effect upon their mental health. In addition to that, 20% of the students said, high school students, that COVID has had a significant effect upon their mental health. I want to emphasize to my parents, community members, colleagues, and board members, our children are not thinking. Our children are feeling stressed, and they're experiencing anxiety in unprecedented numbers. Many of them have crossed the country have already begun to return to school. Because of adult situations, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, come to school, don't come to school, our children are confused and our children are living in a reality where they don't know, like we did, many of us who went to school, whether or not they will continue by the end of the school year and they don't know when things are going to be normal again. This, this is a reality and, and I, I am so passionate about it because I know students who are depressed, clinically depressed. And as a result of that, I had a conversation with Drs. Brown and Dr. Henderson, and I said, we must be proactive in forming a COVID-19 mental health initiative for our students. So as a result of that, I have utilized the experiences that I have had in this area, and I've gathered resources. What we plan to do is to provide a toolkit for our psychologists, our social workers, and our school counselors. So that as our students return to the building, we have a plan in place where we can provide parents, where we can provide staff members, and we can provide our school community with already established resources to serve our children. I stand here and I am passionate because it's a fact. I just said that our children are not thinking. Our children are living in a cloud of uncertainty. Some of the resources we have, we have a crisis text line, we have the Cook County Crisis Services, as well as we have services that, for therapist references that are able to Psychology Today, Mental Health America, school counseling, they're all listed. <coughs> But this is the bigger plan, and this is the real plan. We want to make sure that parents have the information. And we want to make sure that our parents are able to put their fingers on the pulse of where their children are and how their children are feeling. So we have to give parents information. We have to give our school staff information. They'll begin to see students whose personalities have changed. That's a sure sign of depression. We're going to see students that we've known in the past that in some ways we are not going to recognize. And let me add, it's not only our students who are feeling a sense of depression and anxiety, but it's also the adults. So we want to have in place resources for our school staff and our school personnel to be able to tap into the resources that are available to them. As we begin to meet to discuss this plan in greater details, and as I connect with the agencies in this community, I will be providing with you, for Dr. Henderson and Dr. Brown, additional information. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
<laughs> um, I, I totally agree with you. I think, I think collectively, as a nation and a community, we're all feeling like a like trauma we've all kind of endured and are still enduring like this collective trauma upon everyone. And I, I'm really, really grateful that you're focusing on the children because I, I see it in my kids, I see it in their friends, yes. you know, I see it in my student volunteers. It, it, this has taken a huge toll, um, yes. especially on our kids. And I just had an idea, and I'm sorry it's not a question, but as you're gathering these resources and these, um, the crisis lines and the text lines and, and places um, that we're focusing that students can turn to, I think it would be really cool if, you know how you make those magnetic calendars? Mm -hmm. If we made that into a magnet and we had one for every locker, so we had it literally at the students' fingertips and they're looking at it several times a day. I, I think something like that would be a really good resource. It would be something where, you know, I think sometimes when you're talking about the levels of anxiety and depression, you know you want to reach out, but it's so hard to do. It is so hard once you're kind of in that pit of despair to reach out and get help. So if we just make it super easy and put that information at the kids' fingertips, literally in their lockers, and make sure that every child has those resources, I think that would be really helpful. So if there's a way to, I, I don't know how much magnets cost, I don't, I'm sorry. But if we could do something like that, just to make sure that the, the resources are always right there in front of their faces where they need them. And I want to make a point to what you're just saying. Many times our children are not gonna to talk to us, right. but they'll go to their friends, mm -hmm. and their friends high school kids, if they have that information, they'll share it with them. That's a great idea because, again, sometimes they will not go to an adult, but they do talk to one another. I do know that you know we had a lot of these resources already, but one of the things that was done really well last year, and I know it really saved lives, was the fact that there was a flyer that went out to the students and to all the parents last year, and the depression and the anxiety that some of these kids lived, it's so real. And yes, it's it so difficult. Yes, it I can is. tell you, I mean, as a, I, mean, I know the children who were saved by those, those uh, tele, um, the counseling that they had at Proviso East and Proviso West in the, in the health clinics, the, that counseling, I can't tell you how many lives it saved. And I think that building on that and ensuring that it gets into all the parents' hands and all of the students' hands, I would even build on what Amanda was saying and say, I think that the lockers are, is a great idea, but a, but a magnet to go home and put it on their refrigerator, because sometimes kids don't want to make contact in front of other kids because they're embarrassed, yes. and they feel shame, and they feel like they, it, they, there's something wrong with them, and they don't want anybody to know that they're inadequate. So if there was a magnet at home that went home and it was there, then in a quiet space, they might actually make that phone call, or they'll actually connect. Because that's where they, they really feel the, the ability um, and, and you know, especially a, a, a lot of kids have this this, um, this feeling like they, they can't. It's it's trauma, but they, they feel like they, they can't go forward because it will show that they're weak or there's something wrong with them. So um, something that could go home and also I think it could really support a lot of what some of the students are going through because it's really hard. Thank you, Miss Medina. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, um, District is to take trauma so serious, Ms. Medina and Ms. Amanda Grant, that we even have a few sessions um, for District Institute because it is a real deal and we want to spend a great deal of our time um, not just talking about trauma, but having a platform and safe, non judgmental spaces um, for faculty, staff principals and students and good parents. And I would say also have a reconsideration for moving some of the counselors because those counselors have been like the lifeline for these kids. And to keep them in the schools where they, they were at would really help those kids because I can't, those counselors went out of their way in Proviso. Our, our counselors are off the charts. And they were the lifeline for these kids to be able to be successful and get through their things. Yes, ma'am. And I do have three action items. Um, Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I do have three action items. Um, SUNY Code of Conduct, Mastery Connect, and Graduation Requirements. So when we look at student Code of Conduct, it is uh, the, each year the Student Code of Conduct is presented at the start of a new year. 
There are no additions or subtractions in this uh, code book. The code of conduct is the same for each school from prior years. <clears throat> the other item uh, is Mastery Connect. Mastery Connect is a progress monitoring system geared towards English and mathematics. Teachers and administrators need a range of information about student performance. Data from Mastery Connect is used to make laser-focused instructional decisions which improve student outcomes. And English reading and mathematics is a big, big focus for us this school year um, as it relates to graduation and college and career readiness. And finally, does that engine really do that? Do we have still have <laughs> Yes, I think we do. I, I, yes, yes, I think we do. Yes. And, and the final action item, uh, graduation requirements. According to the board policy 6300, <coughs> the Board of Education determines high school graduation requirements. So proviso East addendum regarding graduation requirements. This change will be removed. Proviso East graduation requirements will be consistent with West High School. 22 credits are required for Proviso East and West in order for students to graduate. Okay, thank you. Dr. Brown, quick question on the uh, on the student conduct books. I've noticed in the past that our student handbooks at all three schools have different languages in them around certain issues. Is there a way to streamline that, or is that even necessary, that the three schools, the handbooks, would have, like, been dealing with student conduct? I remember West had a lot more infractions or issues listed than possibly East. Is that something that we want to look at to, to possibly streamline so that they're all the, 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 it was a, we can place the conduct in the, in the district, it should all be the same standards, right? So, uh, Mr. Alexander, I know what you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, but for the last few years now, they've been standardized across all They all are already done. Yeah. Thank you, sir. As a matter of fact, I think it was last year, I printed all three copies for the schools, but right. you told me not to do that anymore. That's right. Right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, so that concludes our any questions. I have one okay. question. Yes. Oh, and related to so in the right. So the policy is up for first reading as far as uh, changing the graduation requirement for Proviso East. I wanted to clarify for everybody that we're changing the graduation requirement back to like, the Carnegie units. That doesn't mean we're throwing competency-based education away. Right? That's correct. That's correct. So there's still CBE. We're just changing the graduation requirements back so that they match everyone. Yes, but a lot of more work needs to be done to make sure that the proviso is truly understand CBE and that we're behaving that way. Fantastic. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Board of Education, colleagues, community, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to talk about uh, the operations department. Before I get uh, started, I just want to say it's a pleasure every day to work with my colleague, Dr. Kevin Brown, and also to see uh, all of his uh, education services staff and how motivated and energetic they are about pursuing their work. And at the same time, I'm extremely honored and proud to be working with the folks that are in the operations department. If they're here tonight, would you please stand, including you, Mr. Bennett, the technology. Uh, just a quick update going uh, around the department here, things that are happening, work that's being done. In technology, under the direction of Mr. Michael Pritchard, uh, they have been supporting registration in all three buildings. There's a lot of technology that needs to be set up in order to help registration work, including uh, Mr. Pritchard uh, working very hard to uh, uh, find us a new, and it looks like better, ID card printing solution that we've implemented uh, the, during registration. They've been distributing laptops to students as they're coming, are they coming in for registration. Uh, getting ready for new staff so that they can make sure that they're set up with the technology that they need. Our, uh, we have a, uh, our nutrition services program is going to need a new point of sale system. So uh, they are working to support that. And another thing that's going on is reviewing the contracts that are going through the technology department. There are various kinds of uh, services and programs to make sure that it's something that we actually need and reaching out to some of the other stakeholders to make sure if it's something we need to continue or if not to go ahead and cancel that in the interest of making sure we're spending our resources uh, properly. Under nutrition services and Ms. Stephanie Garza, uh, who's a, a, a wonderful addition to our staff here in District 209, uh, she's been working tires, tirelessly to uh, get this program up and running. No small task considering you know, how quickly we're trying to get it done. 
Uh, we are about to place our food orders. If you recall a few months ago, you approved us to be uh, members of the Northern Illinois Independent Purchasing uh, Co-op, thank you. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the vendor is GFS, so if you see some bills coming through for GFS, that's the approved vendor for that co-op. We're getting ready to place those orders as well as our dairy and bread orders. Kitchen equipment bid is on the agenda for tonight. Um, you know, with our consultant, they've identified some additions to the kitchen equipment that uh, will be welcome and help us to prepare uh, high quality food for our students and make it more appealing. Uh, we also have on the agenda tonight a uh, recommendation for benefits for nutrition services staff for your approval. And we are working hard to begin uh, ready to serve students on August 20th. That's the first day of student attendance. Under security, again, they are also uh, supporting registration, uh, not just being security, but you know we're hearing stories about their efforts in the school, making sure parents is going through the process and students are getting directed the right way, um, helping just to be friendly faces and helping to make that process as smooth as they can. Um, they also have a role to play as far as uh, the ID printing process. They are working to, uh, uh, this is under the direction of Mr. Lavertis Robinson, um, working with the security leads at the other two buildings to finalize our scheduling so that we can accommodate school day coverage, after school, and facility use. So there's a pretty broad band of time throughout the day and throughout the week where our security staff are on hand and, uh, and available. And uh, also um, getting ready to, to do CPI training for our security staff during the District Institute that's coming up on the 18th. Transportation, uh, under the leadership of Mr. Jerry Garrett, uh, we have a, an action item on the agenda tonight. It is a contract addendum with first student to be able to provide transportation services for the district for the coming school year. Um, this would be the last year that we would be looking to have transportation services as we are uh, skipping down to our bottom bullet point there, continuing our work to develop our SY23 planning to bring transportation in-house. Uh, first student, however, has, uh, has been working with us very closely. Uh, we've got our regular routing completed and uploaded to power school, so students are receiving their bus stop, route, and uh, pickup time and information. Um, also, they will be, uh, will be rolling out the First View app again as a reminder, because it's been a couple years with COVID, but it's an app that uh, parents and students can download on their phones. Uh, they can look up their students' bus stop and see what the bus, where the bus is at on a daily basis. And they can even set an alert to tell them when it's like five minutes away from the house so they can run out the door at the last second and get to the bus stop. Uh, but it helps alleviate a lot of questions. I know a lot of parents uh, really appreciate having that. So we're going to get ready to roll that out. So how many buses do we actually have now? Uh, 46, I believe it is, for the home school. We don't own, you talk about how many buses do we own or how many buses will they be running? We own. Pardon me? How many do we own now? Six buses. Um, we have uh, worked with first student also to pick up where we left off because of COVID with performance tracking and charter scheduling processes that we uh, worked on to make that smooth between both of us so that we can <coughs> keep track and report to the board our on time rates for our transportation and also to make sure that we're most efficiently scheduling any charters that are going to first student. And once again, we are planning for SY23, uh, and we'll be coming back to you throughout the year here with uh, pieces for your approval about that process. Athletics, <clears throat> under uh, leadership of uh, Mr. Calvin Davis, at Proviso East, and Mr. Cyrus McGinnis at Proviso West. Uh, fall sport practices are underway. Uh, we are going to continue our practice. We started uh, back in the spring with having mandatory weekly COVID testing for unvaccinated athletes. Uh, that's through the SHIELD Illinois program and our collection partners through that program through our Visit Health. Um, some news that has just come out from the Illinois High School Association, IHSA. Um, typically, a student has to have passed five classes or 25 hours worth of classes in the previous semester in order to be initially eligible for the next semester. Because of COVID concerns, the IHSA has uh, reduce that down to three classes or a total of 15 hours. Students are still going to have to be passing five classes every week to maintain weekly eligibility. 
uh, but they're implementing this just for the initial eligibility piece. And uh, we're very happy about the uh, upcoming 60th anniversary holiday tournament at Proviso West, um, which we, we didn't get to have it last year, but we're going to have it this year. Our dates for advanced planning, just so you're aware of them, are December 27th through the 30th. And uh, the athletic directors, those gentlemen, are working right now in order to help uh, support that tournament uh, by reaching out to potential sponsors for sponsorship opportunity. Uh, tonight, again, we have the student transportation item uh, that's before you for approval. The request for bids for the kitchen equipment at Proviso East, West, and PMSA, and the item for nutrition services uh, staff benefit. Are there any questions? Um, yes, I have a question. I have two questions. Um, on nutrition, is this for the insurance? Is this are these employees considered tier one or tier two? We don't have them identified by tier one or tier two. That relates to our O and M staff and right. our particular CBA. So right now, the uh, food service workers are not associated with any of the three bargaining units that we have here. Um, what we did for that benefit level is identify for the uh, food service workers who are working 30 or more hours a week that they would have access to uh, the, um, you know, because our health plan you know, basically says if you work 30 hours or more, you have to offer the benefits. Um, but for the employee only coverage at a rate of 50% employee contribution, 50% district, which is similar to what we have in there, I think, for the Tier 2 o and employees. Yes, I was wondering if it would be cheaper. I mean, they need some help. with the. We've been talking about that, discussing that for the maintenance. And if we could get, you know, maybe have them team up, could we get the insurance cheaper so everyone can win? Yeah, we have to look into that um, you know, so that we can work out with uh, Mr. Moody. Yeah, that, that would be good. Uh, and what is the total cost uh, for the proposed food operation? Uh, you mean across all? Yeah. You know, I don't have that right in front of me, but we are expecting our costs to come in similar to where they were at, uh, you know, when we were uh, contracting it out to Sodexo. Um, and I can get that back for you, Mrs. Kelly, I'll give you the better. So do you feel that it will be cost neutral? We're hoping so. We're hoping so. There's actually uh, some very high reimbursement rates that are being offered this year uh, through participation in the seamless summer option. And so, um, you know, when, uh, and also we're looking to make sure we increase participation. We want our students to eat healthy, nutritious meals at school because it's going to help them be healthy and also hopefully uh, do better academically. So we're looking at a two-pronged approach here, increased participation, and we're going to have higher reimbursement rates. And of course, uh, Ms. Garza and her staff and I will be doing everything we can to make sure that we're managing our food costs and still providing high quality food. End of the day, we hope that we, we come out ahead of that. And my next question is for transportation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is the money amount on this one? So the uh, money amount would be Approximately, uh, with a 16% increase for the home school routes that would be run, and the uh, eight run that they're doing in the morning for the math science academy kids, about $289,000 um, above what it would have been without the 16% increase. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dan, I got a question. Yes, sir. So, in relation to Ms. Kelly's question, um, you're saying it's going to cost us the same as it used to cost us with Sodexo. Now, that's only while we get the equipment, correct? Because you only get the equipment one time. You know, the kitchen equipment, I mean. Yeah, we're, we're going to have some cost there with that. After that, it should be su substantially lower than with Sodexo. That's one of the reasons we decided to go this way, correct? Well, I, and I think that the costs that I'm, I'm thinking of aren't really including the $190,000 for the equipment. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the more ongoing operational costs as far as uh, where we'll be. So, you know, uh, obviously, if we get the kitchen properly equipped and we don't have to keep buying equipment, yeah, we won't have those year-over-year chargers. Uh, we'll have to maintain things in the equipment in the kitchen mm -hmm. as we go along. 
Um, but I was speaking more to just our operational costs. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question actually about uh, student transportation, and this might be maybe more for Bill. Um, I'm looking on the um, addendum, the second page of the addendum, where it's talking about um, basically wiping out any uh, claims for payments for 2019, 2020, and 2020-21 school years, because I know that was kind of a hiccup <coughs> last year, so we're done with that. This, this, uh, this new addendum essentially wipes out all those claims. So as part of the addendum, they're agreeing to waive those disputed claims that we had relative to payments for the past year and a half. Okay, and then my follow-up question is, is there something in here that if we have a, a similar situation or, you know, something happens this year, are we only paying for the bus rides that we use and not for an overall service? So with respect to student-to-home routes and ELOs, the answer would be yes. But with respect to extracurricular routes, there is a guaranteed floor. So okay. there's a guaranteed route of 266. So we're going to pay 266. But on the other two, it's the same contractual language that we had before, which is you're going to pay for the routes that you run. Okay. So let, let me add to that. Um, while that guarantee is 266, the actual number of routes they ran last year was approximately 700. About 700 rounds. Okay, so we're not in any danger of like losing money on that or anything. Not at all. Right, perfect. Thank you. All right. How many did we put out for the kitchen equipment? How many what? Bids. We issued oh, one yeah. request for bids. We, we issued the bid and we received two bids back, two uh, responses. Okay. Did you, I didn't see those. Did you put them out? I think they're included in the board. They're out there. Oh, I don't think I didn't see that. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Mr. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Mr. Taylor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good evening, Board of Education. Good evening, Good evening sir. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for letting me serve the Children's Department of Project Nazi High School. Um, you start you had a question uh, about MERV filtration. Uh, yes, Proviso Township High Schools meets the requirements of the CDC guidelines of filtration methods. Did you get plasmas? Ma'am? Did you get plasmas that came put into the data? Plasmas. The MERV rating filters? Correct. We do have those at Math and Science East and So tonight I have the pleasure to introduce our consultant that's working with the facilities department, uh, Ms. Nancy Governall. She's going to come up with a presentation for us related to the electrical change order. She's going to talk about every about the, the flow and the, and the dollars. Nancy? Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Nancy Governall, and I've been on board for about seven weeks. So I'm assisting the facilities department and in interfacing with the um, facilities master plan implementation team. So what I want to talk about today, I think this was brought up last month, uh, but there's a finalization of the electrical change order. Um, there was a range of between sixty and eighty thousand dollars for this change order, um, and I just wanted to run through a few photographs and explain why this was required. So at the beginning of uh, this time period, about roughly about six weeks ago, um, it was discovered that there were a lot of, you know, a fair amount of code compliant wiring changes that needed because wiring was combined, and I think maybe we discussed this last month, um, but the, the outlets were combined with the lighting distribution from the existing system. Um, when some of the roofs were, um, or the ceilings were demolished, there was a lot of this work exposed that wasn't exposed because of the pre-demolition conditions. Um, so in a nutshell, um, when I change over to the other uh, photograph, you can see the, the photograph on the, the top left-hand side, that would be a typical existing condition. On the lower right-hand side, 
um, you can see that there are a number of layers of ceilings that were demolished, and attached to that ceiling were conduits. So clearly the conduits had to be taken down when the demolition occurred, and then there were other, not in necessarily this photo, but in other photos, um, areas of conduit that were combined, that had to be taken apart and distributed in a different way. The base contract included new conduit and wiring for the lighting system, but it didn't include money to take care of these things that were unforeseen conditions that were uncovered during the course of construction. So, um, the contractor, the electrical contractor on board, has been working on a time and material basis to take care of all of the issues that were uncovered through this process. Um, so it was a, a voluminous amount of work, and for each individual room that had to be completed through the time and material basis, we have uh, documentation including photographs and a work ticket for each location. So this is how we add up to the total amount of uh, 75000 to complete all this work. So there is an exhaustive amount of documentation that is available to you. Um, and there is logic in terms of the code compliance issue to be able to do this work. So this is the first large change order above $25,000. Um, the second large change order to be discussed is a skylight structural reinforcement change order. What happened during the course of construction, uh, there were a number of skylights on the floor. And you notice in all of the items listed in, or shown in yellow are the locations of the skylights. There are skylights in the classrooms and there are skylights in the corridor, so above. Over the years, historically, those have been removed. So you, don't, you, don't, you no longer have skylights, but you had an opening where the skylight did exist before. When uh, work was proceeding, one of the, the structural decks, the roof decks that is below the surface, even with the ceiling area of the building, actually fell down. So during the course of construction, obviously that was unsafe and it need to be needed to be explored. Um, the team explored what was going on with these skylight locations and as shown in the, the photograph on the left, um, this particular skylight was actually reinforced with wood and it was also wood that was attached to gypsum sidewalls. So it wasn't structurally sound. And if something would have happened or gone onto this area on the roof above, <coughs> it may have collapsed the skylight infill that was there. So this happened in 12 different locations um, on the third floor. Uh, if you notice on the, the sketch on the uh, right-hand side, there's an a, a I-beam. And then there's two pieces of decking that inter interconnect in there. The area listed in red, you can see the little red dotted area, that is a, a um, structural decking that doesn't actually intersect with the beam. So it was basically floating in air. Um, so the solution for this, um, the architects came up with a solution to include a center beam. The image on the left does not have a center beam that's existing conditions. The image on the right includes a center beam that adds a certain amount of reinforcement so that this decking is not going to fall through and you won't have any kind of uh, risk when you're up on the roof trying to do work. This all became really important because there were situations where new equipment had to be included on top of the roof um, that intersected with some of these areas. So it kind of happened uh, throughout the third floor. Um, in this case, one of the solutions for design to reinforce the sidewalls of the, the, the roof decking was to have an angle on each one of the existing beams on the right hand and left hand side. Um, all skylight locations received the center beam, but only some of the areas needed to be reinforced with an angle at the edges. As a result, um, the amount of the proposal to do this work was estimated at $122,000. Um, and that is not a firm amount at this point. The team is negotiating and reducing the scope of the work because some of this work didn't have to be done in the field. So that let, that final number is not in yet, um, but you know, it should be a substantial amount of reduction for this work. So are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, 
um, uh, the wall was thought to be low bearing. Uh, why wasn't it tested and vetted? Let's go. Uh, this is a skylight. This isn't the. Then she should the wall. No, this uh, is the skylight. Oh, the oh, skylight. okay. That's the skylight. This is the skylight. Okay, but it's still like a forty-five thousand dollars more, isn't it? No, that's the. AC. So she said the, she said it was one twenty-two. Yeah, this is for the skylights. They're roughly ten thousand dollars a piece, and it was twelve of them. The proposal was about one hundred twenty-five thousand. I believe you are referring to uh, some duct work on the south side of the building that's going to support RTU. Okay, yeah. yeah this that's is a different what I, that's what I, I thought that was all included. No, ma'am. Okay. But it's still like forty five thousand dollars more. Yeah, that'll be presented by Perkins and Perkins. Yeah, okay. this is just for this one. Okay. okay. Okay, the next presentation will come from Gil Bain. Uh, Ms. Michelle McClain. Classrooms between August 11th and the 13th. 
Um, however, work in the basement of the mechanical rooms are scheduled and still ongoing. It will go to 9-7 with final test and balance of the entire system by 9-13. Moving on, on over to East. Uh, it was mentioned in the previous uh, report about the skylights, and it's important to note that as we work out the situation with the skylights, it affected the installation of the rooftop units. We couldn't grow those on the roof if we didn't feel that the roof structure was sound. I am happy to report that all of the rooftop units have been delivered for the project, and we are anticipating startup for those units. It's a total of eight, I believe. The startup of the units are occurring this week with the switch over to permanent power occurring by August 20th, pending combat delivery of our new 480 volt service over at Proviso. So, a Proviso East, rather. This is actually Proviso West. Proviso East, um, ceiling tile in the classroom. 70% of the classrooms have been installed. So with means with the ceiling tile, again, we're working our way out of the building so that we are ready for the teaching and learning environment in the next, in the next upcoming week. Uh, movers are on site as of today, starting to put furniture back in the rooms. The rooms that are highlighted in green are the ones that have um, above ceiling inspections complete, tile complete. We are working on uh, small finishes items like the um, base around the room that needs to be installed and any paint touch ups. Uh, areas in yellow, where our grid is installed, working on final uh, above ceiling inspections, and we'll drop that ceiling tile accordingly uh, and continue to work our way again out of all of the classrooms on the third floor and the corridor. The construction clean is in process, essentially removing all of our temporary protection from light fixtures, from walls, from doors, from floors, etc. And we'll be working to, to uh, complete the final clean end of this week and well into this weekend. It will definitely be a photo finish over at Proviso East just because of the value of work that we had to complete over at East this summer. Uh, allowances update, this is for West, 257,000 allowances as of the end of the month of June, I'm sorry, July rather, 127,000 allowances have been used with 129,000 cumulatively left over or for Proviso West. For East, uh, $378,000 in allowances for the stadium. At this time, $289,000 has been, I'm sorry, $24,000 has been used with roughly $289,000 remaining, rather. And then for Proviso East, the mechanical upgrades, $520,000 in allowances. We've used roughly $160,000. We have $350,000 and some change left over in allowances to get us through the rest of the program in allowances. Update on our interns. Uh, they attended White Sox games with us, Gilbane Professionals Group, uh, were some of our mentors that help with our interns. Uh, photo on the left is obviously the game. Photo on the right, they attended a rooftop lunch and learn at Office Revolution, downtown Chicago. To learn more about architecture, one of the students, uh, Mark Robinson, was interested in architecture, uh, interior construction, and learn about corporate furniture dealers, manufacturers, et cetera. The intern's last day with us, unfortunately, was August 6th. Uh, we were willing to extend it, but um, they were eager to get back to school and start to prepare for school. Final presentations <coughs> were given to Gil Bay leadership and their peers last week. Um, at the board's request, we can have, definitely have them come and do their presentation. One of them, uh, Dose, is at Proviso Math and Science. She can come at any time. Mark Robinson, unfortunately, has transferred out of the district due to a parent relocation to Kentucky. However, I did uh, record his presentation so I can share that with the group um, as you guys see fit. Back in the book, the presentation. Okay. Question. Uh, yes, I have a question. I'm, I'm really, really happy uh, for both of those students. Thank you all so very much. But um, as you know, uh, we had the opportunity to walk the uh, mm -hmm. third floor last week. And as I understand it, and, well, first of all, you know I have great concern around um, handing that over to us. Mm -hmm. Now, um, at that time, you had said August 16th is the date that we will be. Correct. Okay, so we'll do it with that. We still are. August 16th, I understand, is the first day for 
teachers to be in the building. Uh, we will be ready for that by Sunday, August the 15th. Okay. Uh, we understand after that time any work needs to go on, you know, off hours, et cetera, as teachers start to move into building and students. First day of school, August 20th, for freshmen and sophomores. Right. Very good. Thank you so very much. I have a question. Uh, last month we talked about minority um, contractors. And I was just what you were supposed to send over a list. I provided the EIP report to uh, Mr. Taylor. Oh, you did? Economic inclusion plan. My, that's our minority report. I did provide the report. It lists all of it lists all of our contractors um, and the whether that whether they are minority or woman-owned businesses because mm -hmm. we track both. It lists the amount of their contract um, completed to date. So it's important what they build to date and where that status is. And so right now we were at 9.4% and 9.6% of our total work billed to date was done by economic inclusion partners for the project. Okay, and well, okay, I'll have to get that from uh, Mr. Taylor. Yes ma'am, I'll share it with Dr. Henderson, and then Dr. Henderson will push it off. Okay, and my, my other question is, why are we just using, going with 10%? Is there a reason? We are. So if, if, if I could speak to that, uh, early on in the process, uh, we talked about a threshold of 15%. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, because all of the work that we were doing, there's hardly any, if, if any, paving companies uh, that's black or women owned. So we decided to stick with a number around 15%. We thought that was a decent number that came to the facilities meeting, that came to the board meeting. And, um, that was acceptable at that time. We've been meeting that about the first two sequences. This one we did. I thought we were at like 11 percent, but the last two sequences we were at like 14 and a half, 13 and a half. So it's important to note that the number I quoted is the work that we build today. We are okay. still building and filling and working it out. So as long as our contractors meet the requirements, let me rephrase that. As long as they meet the goals that they set forth in their bids then we will get close to that 11%. But the 9.4 and 9.6 is based off of what we've actually installed to date, and we're still working through the program for the rest of the Yeah, because that's really, it's still low. Uh, I mean, we have a $77 million project going. Understood. Thank you. 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 And this is sort of like a rhetorical question, but it just strikes me funny that when we talk about, this is 2021, and when we talk about workers, we, we represent African Americans, Hispanics, and women as minorities. Is, does that bother anybody? Yeah. That we actually talk yeah. about groups of people in 2021 as less than, mm -hmm. and then we say that we don't have enough of, mm -hmm. And we, and we practice these phases, but at the same time, these other groups are getting $77 million of these less than people's money. Mm -hmm. I just wanted that to sit in with us. Because I'm so sick of less than, we can't find qualified. In this whole big old 50 states of the United States, we ain't got no black or brown folks that can lay pavement. I'm talking to y'all. I'm talking to the system. Totally I'm talking to the system, y'all. Just y'all just work here. We got to do better, folks. Listen, I'm not going to no restaurant and they don't tell me what I got to eat on the menu. <laughs> when I go to the restaurant, I order what I want to when I pay my money. We're paying the taxpayers' dollars, and this board has said what it expects for that money, but we keep getting told that that can't be done, but yet still, these companies still want us board to pay them their taxpayers' money. So we have to go tomorrow after this meeting and make excuses to our constituents as to why we're paying their money to groups of people that cannot provide them with equity in the disbursement of their funds. And we sit here month after month after month begging people that are taking our money to spend it the way that we said spend it. I, boy, I say we stop asking. Why do we have to ask people how we spend the taxpayers' dollars? We're providing services. We are the, the, the purchasers. We're the, we're the consumers. We're the customers. But we sit here month after month after month and beg for scraps. 
This stuff has to stop. If we're going to have equity in this district, it has to start with our business as a board. And we have to demand better. Nothing personal against you guys. This is just the system I'm speaking to. And this is the language that we use. But then we'll sit here and say, we want better for our scholars. When as adults, we represent everything that the system tells us to represent. Even in the language we use. In 2021, there are no women out here that are, that, and we're still talking about them as if they're something other than a human being that has a job and a profession and a profession to be able to do something. We're going to sit here and talk about equity, and in our person and in our business dealings, we're not exercising that. Mr. Gleason, I'm going to say it because I will call you and ask whether any board member does. We need to look at our contracts and look at what we're asking for and see if it's legal and then reassess if we want to retain the services of people that cannot provide us the service we're asking for. And I'll say it, because it's time out for that. We're about to start a new year with high expectations for our students and scholars and administration, or we have to have high expectations for how we spend their money. And if we say something as a board, we darn sure better stick to it and hold people accountable moving forward. Or unless we're just going to continue kicking the can down the road, talking the talk and not walking the walk. I agree, Mr. President. I'm done. Sorry you guys had to get that. We just had a conversation, and I had several conversations with some constituents, and they're like, Mr. Alexander, you guys are just like everybody else. Y'all talk this stuff about this, but y'all sit there every month, and I watch y'all, and y'all let them tell us why y'all can't do this and why y'all can't do that, but they still taking our money, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Okay. Okay. It just doesn't make any sense. So please, let's, let's work together to do everything possible to increase the amount of equity Equity, not minority, this and that. I understand the lingo. Equity in providing services and jobs for everyone, especially that are representative of the population that are spending that money. I agree with you, Mr. President. I mean, month after month, they come to us to approval of the change order, approval of this, or not here, and we say yes, 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 and yet. They can't respond to us with a yes and, 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 get, and get, give us what we want. That's it. That's all. It can't go just one way. It has to be both ways. That's all I'm saying. And I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President, for just saying the words for me because it just makes sense. Yeah. Um, besides that, I got two questions. Um, <clears throat> so I see Wes has a different type of system for the AC and uh, East, correct? East has a force there system that does work from there about VABs in each room, I don't know, per room, is that the system that's designed. Uh, would these systems uh, consider for efficiency, high efficiency, and uh, I see you got 480 units, so that's efficient, but would they consider for 90 plus efficiency the units with RTUs or the units bought from West? Well, I mean, that will bring us some big cost savings when it comes to energy savings. Yeah, the, uh, the mechanical systems at, at both schools, we went through a multiple different design options for that early with working with the building teams. And it really, it, we wanted to try to be as similar as possible with both, with both systems because of the interconnectivity of, the, of materials and, and trading of, of uh, maintenance. But because of the, the floor to floor, Heights at West, we had really limited space within the ceiling to do any duct work. So we, we wanted to, we, we started down the path of saying, let's do both the same exact systems. Um, we went with a VRFs, we ended up going with a VRF system at, at East with, with uh, in ceiling duct work and with the, um, the, uh, <coughs> the VRF style uh, cabinet unit heater at uh, vertical cabinet unit heater at um, West because we didn't have enough room to do a ducted system there. But the, 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 the way that, that uh, heat and cooling is transferred at both schools is very highly efficient. Um, I don't have the specific numbers on the, on the efficiency range on that, but um, as we went through the systems, we, we looked at you know, what is the return on, on cost for that. Um, presented that to the, the building teams, uh, presented that through the FMP process. We had a whole matrix that was developed um, by the mechanical engineer for that, that weighed out all those all those approaches, and that was the, the decision that was ultimately made. What was the efficiency rate? 
I don't know that I have that number, but I can certainly get it. It's a 90 plus, 80. I mean, I, I don't know that I have that number, okay. but I can certainly get it. Boy, the reason I'm asking this is because when you install a unit in your, say, your home, you always want a, a high efficiency system. Um, Besides lasting longer, it, it, it provides for better energy efficiency, so our bills will be a lot. I mean, it's significantly lower when we pay our bills. And we're just talking about paying high bills, right? So uh, I, I want the, these engineers to consider that you know we're building state of the art, and if we're building state of the art, we got to build efficient. Uh, state of the art is efficiency. Yeah, and, and, and I totally agree with you uh, yeah. on that. Uh, I can just use it as anecdotally, uh, similar project where we. Replaced uh, you know, fluorescent lights with LEDs. We had a, a, a building that did not have a air conditioning system in it. We went in with the same VRF system that is in the east um, at that building, and we actually saw a reduction in energy use cost right. because of the efficiency that was built into the, the system overall. And, and we, we expect we, we can't say that we'll see a reduction in cost necessarily. We don't know what what everything's going to uh, what all the all the nuances are to the system, but we expect similar to the ones from this uh, uh, Right, well naturally you will get an efficiency. I mean, you, um, you, you, you will be able to get a social difference in a cost savings just because the, not because the equipment is efficient, because it's newer and, and it's more efficient. Because you could get the same equipment 10 years from now and install it, it'll be more efficient than previously. Yeah, what I mean is equipment is designed to be efficient. Yes. And 90 and plus. And or even above that. I'll, I'll, I'll get you some specific. Yeah, because I mean, really, I mean, that's something that uh, this is where we're going. You know, we want to reduce our carbon footprint. Absolutely. So, hopefully, that was considered. I mean, we're we're lockstep with you with you on that, as well as our engineers are, and, and we work through that process to make sure that your your you know the dollars that you spend on uh, both from the construction side and from the operation side are, are are as efficiently used as possible. Yeah, well, I, I really hope they are efficient. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. If I could just add one thing, uh, Michelle mentioned that those units that provide the East will be started up. They will be started up, but we had a delay in the in the permitting process with Connie and Maywood. Those units will be started up, taken back offline, and brought back online about four to five business days later. So we don't want to paint a phony picture here that once we start up, they will be up and running consistently. They will not. The startup will happen. It will be shut back down. A few business days later, it will resume. Once the, the main throat of electrical is brought in, it will resume and actually give us conditioning on the third floor. Are they making sure they got enough power on those transformers from the utility? Yes, sir. Comet Ed and a large engineering did all that work. Um, in my opinion, Comet is fantastic. Um, I heard of, I never heard of a village ask uh, a utility company for their electrical license, uh, and that's what they would be for uh, ComEd, and ComEd is our utility. Uh, they do a fantastic job, and they were directly in line with a large engineer, and they was actually uh, really impressed with the design work from a large engineer related to the transformers. Okay, so all the rooms at east and west on the third floors will be ready by August 16th for, uh, for student teaching and learning. Yes, but uh, at west, they will have AC by August 20th. At east, it will follow pending the completion of the service from ComEd so that we can properly start up all the units. But all the ceilings and everything, yes. all the ceilings and all the ceilings Correct. will be ready for teaching and learning. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so ComEd's got to go with their trucks and hook up the lights to the right. utility. Yes, right. So so for West we have August 20th and East is pending. So pending pending, does that mean that it could be three weeks from now? Pending could mean a long period of time. No, it, it, we will get the schedule from Kami and Kami received the permit yesterday from the village of Maywood. Um, we will receive the schedule from Kami tomorrow. We will share with Dr. Henderson and I'm sure he will show with the Board of Education. But it is the goal. Kami understands that the school is really pushing them to really give us power before the point. But with this short time frame, we don't really believe in it. Actually, what Kami is hiring additional contractors 
to actually help them bring in the main growth into our old ATO and provide the reason I stand. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So next up will be Perkins and Wheel. Um, Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Pleased to give an update on where we sit on the design and uh, some construction items here. As you see, uh, this is a little bit of an older photo of the uh, the main bleachers at Proviso East uh, that are going in. There's been quite a bit of work that's happening on those um, over the last few days. Even today, we saw a lot of work going on out, out there. Um, great to see um, all that work proceeding. Um, we will go through the sequence three project schedule, just seeing where we are today. Um, as was mentioned, we'll have we'll touch on you know a, the a quick pace of construction out. Uh, it brings a few things up that we'll need to talk about. Uh, we'll talk through the uh, proviso east uh, rooftop unit bearing uh, issue uh, that has been come up, came up recently. We'll go through the sequence for the uh, occupancy. Uh, of the sequence to work. Today we had a meeting with the Regional Office of Education on site of both East and West, walking them through the site so that they understood where we sat on there and uh, our process to get full occupancy for those uh, facilities. Um, then the East Stadium Grandstand, uh, some requested images for that and some discussion on the West Tunnel um, to the auto shop. So as we said, this gray line here may be a little bit further back uh, towards the towards the end of summer break, uh, but we are in this uh, the summer break period where we had a uh, stall in the design process in order to meet the uh, the demands of construction here. Uh, but we anticipate uh, as construction starts to wane down, we will start back up with the sequence three design, looking at all the remaining allowances as well as all the remaining contingency dollars that are coming back to the project and balancing out the rest of the sequence three um, with the, the, uh, the uh, design development process beginning at that point, understanding where we sit uh, financially and uh, anything that can be added to that project and bidding that project uh, close to the end of the year here. Any overall questions on the, uh, the sequence three design schedule? Now, it, it does show that there is a, a uh, flood control design portion of the schedule here. Up there. Um, this was completed and work uh, was was uh, purchased through that. Some of that work has been installed. Some of that work is still waiting on acquisition of materials due to delays uh, in um, just in the in acquisition of materials due to the COVID uh, issues out there as well. Um, and will be installed when, when that gets on the site. And so sequence three, does that include there was a discussion over here that provides the West bathrooms. Yeah, the the uh, the scope. I think at the last board meeting we went through the scope of the plumbing for sequence three at both East and West. Right. That's included in this. Right. Um, as well as some improve the improvements to the uh, the cafeterias uh, that was discussed. Um, we we have some additional engineering that it, that will be required uh, for the uh, some of the cafeteria equipment. Uh, looking at some other cafeteria improvements here as well. Um, and then uh, there's some other problems. Science classrooms. I'm sorry, science classrooms, uh, biology science classrooms that provide the least. There was, I don't know if it was the majority of the board, but there was some interest in the board getting some information about the feasibility of expanding the work on the provider of toilets. Um, that maybe there was some extra money that could be available for that. I know that was, you know, President Alexander. <coughs> Talking about, it. I was talking about it. Asked a couple of questions. And I was wondering if there was any discussion or looking into expanding that. We haven't discussed it generally. We've been focused. I think. I think most most of the effort has been focused on uh, laser focused on getting the, the uh, sequence two work done. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, if there is you know a, a reallocation of funds within sequence three or uh, additional funds brought in, or looking at the balance of funds that are coming out of sequence two into sequence three. If there's an opportunity to do additional plumbing work, we'd certainly uh, like to like to take advantage of that, um, since you'll get some more uh, benefits from uh, doing that work um, simultaneously with the other work that's right. already out there. Yeah. Um, 
uh, we do see, uh, we, we went through uh, the original process of, of looking at the, the overall cloning scope. Uh, we, we took a look at the entire building, so we've done a lot of, of legwork with that already. Um, so this the scope that we had identified in the last board meeting is really looking at what, what can fit into the funds that were available for that, that allocation at that time. So right, I understand that. Where's the scope work that you did I'm on the plumbing? We discussed the three million at East and three million at West yes. last month, and we wanted to know what the remedy was or what the professional uh, advice moving forward because we understood that that would take care of the main plumbing, but we would still have problems down the line. Mm -hmm. So what was the remedy with that? What's the plan? Considering uh, that the systems over at Proviso East and Proviso West, they're operational as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have some stagnant water with some discoloration in it. Uh, we were flushing those systems again like we did last year. At this time, we're going to rethink that process and see if we want to bring that back to Dr. Henderson for consideration. But uh, we're not moving forward with that project as of right now. If it pleases the board, I would like to, and, and Doc, if it pleases the board, that we not spend $3 million at either of those schools on plumbing with the risk of having brown water and toilets that don't flush until there is an extensive presentation to this board that makes it financially feasible for us to do so. We need to have a timeline if that's going to happen to where we can correct that other problem. Because as I mentioned at the last board meeting, nobody spends $3 million for plumbing and can explain to constituents all of this intricacy of what it is that we're doing and how that makes sense. It's just not going to happen. So we need to really either hold off on that altogether until we can make a significant, we can't have brown water and just say we spent $3 million. Can't happen. We can't have non-flushing toilets and we just spent $3 million. I would rather us as a board make the decision to go into council. Dr. Henderson, you work it out, present it to us. It may be more feasible for us to hold off altogether and save that money until we can, or at least give us a price 30 days later that we asked for last month as to how much it would cost to make sure that those things don't happen. Or if that's even feasible, I don't know. We just asked a question 30 months or, or 30 days ago, and I'm not getting an answer other than we're moving forward. Moving forward with. Mr. President, I, that's a great idea. I suggest value engineering. I mean, get your pens and pencils and just, you know, you're in the design space right now, right? Get a little value engineering in there. Maybe we can get this accomplished. Maybe it won't be three million a little more, but we want all this corrected. Yeah, one thing that um, I'd just like to mention that'll help us develop that scope and target dollar pool to have the biggest impact is that we've been working with uh, LT and his staff, uh, as well as Nancy, uh, to develop a testing scope uh, to uh, gather more detail and uh, get a better picture of the entire plumbing system. Um, so that will be, that's what we've been working on over the past 30 days. Um, we will be reviewing that with LT uh, and get his thoughts on the matter and be sending it out for proposals to three different testing agencies. So that way they can provide a report uh, and, and give us an idea as to where the uh, plumbing, domestic plumbing system is in most need of upgrades, given that we know we have limited dollars and want to make the biggest impact. Thank you, so what's your name? Carl. Carl, Thank you. that's all I'm asking for. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. We gotta go out and answer questions tomorrow, Carl, so folks are gonna be like, you know, they, they call me with these questions and I'm like, uh. Well, thank you for Carl for. Uh, yes, thank you, Carl. That's, that's all. I'm, that's all I'm asking. Yeah, please value engineer those. Yeah. Uh, not only the, the the design, but value engineer those time and materials. I was looking at your cost per electrician. I mean, I know they're eighty-five dollars an hour right now, plus plus overtime. But you know, you guys are charging us at least twenty-five percent on top of that instead of you know the architectural fee of eight to ten percent. So if it's time and material, I'd appreciate if you guys charge us at least ten percent and not twenty-five. Out of labor since it's time of the If you look at the numbers, you should see for yourself. And I guess I, guess I would like to re ask the question that I That's asked kind of hot last month, hot. month where you know, we took four and a half, we had taken four and a half million dollars, put it into the capital fund, and then we took it back out. And I would like to know if it's if we put that four and a half million back in, would that help get toilets done at Proviso West? Yeah. I would love to know. I think that's what he's going to work on. 
That's why I just asked you. It's the same thing. So, so that's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You just asked him. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we need to see how much. What's going to be the best input bang for the buck? The Sam's technical word for calling it. That's what we need. Okay. So then we can make a decision, an educated decision, with all that information. Right. If that's the case, then we've got it. But if not, we really want to move forward, knowing that we're going to have possible groundwater and not flushing toilets. So yeah, hopefully when we get that from Carl, we yeah. have to make an educated decision. All right. So Chief, your should keep that in mind. We're doing time and material here, and 25 percent over whatever. I mean, it's it's, it's a lot. You're charging us $118 an hour, you know, you're paying 85 I know you got to make your money, but 25% is way too much. 10% would be feasible. So in that kind of material, guys, and he charges, he charges a percentage on the material as well, so you're charging us time and material percentages all over the place. Well, the percentage is the same. Right? Yeah, that's, come on. You got, you, we pay you guys 8%. Why well, can't it, you know, 10% is feasible. We give, we give them a lot of work already. I don't know why they charge you for this. It's upsetting to me. I do this every day, especially on electrical. Any other questions, concerns? Uh, so, are you getting more? Yeah, we're, we're just starting with the project schedule now. Um, we'll go on to the uh, the East RTU bearing again. This is a this as we're going through. You know, we have we have a significant amount of work that happens uh, on, a, on a daily basis at each one of the schools. Um, this issue came up, and, and I'll let I'll let Carl walk through uh, a little deeper than I would be able to provide at this point. Um, thank you. Thanks, Mike. So this was uh, an uncovered condition at Proviso East. Um, so I'm just going to kind of review the situation and the solution that was developed. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, we are placing rooftop mechanical units, or R2s, for short, on top of the building to provide fresh air to all the classrooms. RTU, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, rooftop unit, so, or generically mechanical unit. <laughs> yeah, the great things you saw, Rodney? <laughs> the great thing picture? Yeah, the yeah, but I just did the, oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we had to place these on the roof, and when we place these on the roof, we need to find adequate structural bearing uh, for those locations. And to do so, uh, the structural engineer, Kirks and Will, uh, visited the site and investigated various areas where we're going to need to bring down uh, structure to bear on the existing uh, existing walls that are in this area. Uh, a lot of these walls obviously are concealed construction and are difficult to see, and so we did extensive exploration uh, crawling around the attic and, and reviewing these bearing locations. Uh, unfortunately, in this one location, uh, despite our best efforts during uh, design to investigate it, uh, when construction began, we found that there was a wood frame uh, corridor wall instead of uh, load-bearing multi-wide masonry. Multi-wide just means there's multiple layers of masonry stacked together. Uh, this is the only portion of corridor wall in the entire uh, third floor that is uh, not multi-wide masonry. Uh, and there was evidence when we were doing our review that the wall in this area uh, was in fact load-bearing masonry. However, once construction started and the wall was opened up, it was discovered that it was in fact wood frame. Uh, as a result, we had to find an, altern excuse me, an alternative location for the rooftop unit to sit uh, uh, that would be structurally supportive of that. So this is just a little diagram demonstrating a few different locations we considered. Um, just kind of quickly go through kind of the larger purple area that you see in the center is over the auditorium. We didn't want to consider that because obviously the auditorium, you have high floor to ceiling heights that require scaffolding and be incredibly uh, cost prohibitive to place the unit over that uh, portion of the room. Uh, in the yellow area, which is where you have a, a number of science rooms uh, on the third floor, there's a lot of uh, mechanical exhaust. And per the mechanical code, where we bring our fresh air intake needs to be separated by a certain distance from where you're exhausting fumes. So that area was unable to uh, uh, made to be worked. The red area that you see, the original location, is where we encountered the wood framing, and therefore it's not a suitable bearing location. And then the kind of the green or aqua um, area that you see uh, near the lower left-hand image had existing roof structures uh, that would conflict with putting that uh, rooftop unit there. So the blue box you see there was found to be the only suitable location uh, for this rooftop unit. So even if we were to begin this process uh, anew from the very beginning and we had this information that we discovered during construction, this still would have been the final location for this rooftop unit. 
So when we were considering solutions here, and you can see the solution on the left here, which was to simply move the rooftop unit uh, to the north about 50 feet, and then reconnect to the original penetration location of the roof with exterior, uh, additional exterior ductwork. Uh, we thought that this solution had a number of different advantages over uh, some other possible considerations. Uh, so I'll just kind of run through this list on the right here. Uh, we did explore the idea of trying to reinforce uh, or extend over the, uh, the wood frame walls with some larger pieces of steel. And we got some initial estimates from Gilbane and those costs started to uh, begin in excess of $65,000. And that did take into account some other uh, ancillary costs that would be incurred. Uh, so this solution does not require additional structural steel. We were able to reuse the steel that was part of the original base documents and simply relocate it to another portion of the roof. Uh, we avoided storage charges for the rooftop units. If we were to go the structural reinforcing route, this piece of steel that uh, would have been required to make this solution work uh, is not a readily available uh, piece of steel. Therefore, it would have interrupted the delivery of the rooftop units and there would have been costs incurred to store these rooftop units off-site in a safe location. Uh, additionally, with the larger piece of steel, it would have required uh, an additional crane remobilization. Uh, this solution uses readily available components that can be fab you know, fabricated in just a couple of days. Uh, there's no duplicative cost. All, all the original bid materials are utilized, so there's nothing that the district is paying for that was being torn out and, and, and not utilized. Uh, and lastly, uh, Gilbane, on their bid form for this contractor, obtained a unit price for galvanized steel ductwork. So that way we can ensure that the largest portion of this particular cost proposal uh, received a competitive bid um, and, it would have sh and it shields the district from the material escalations that we've seen over the past uh, six months due to COVID and supply chain constraints. So as a result, the cost proposal right now is approximately uh, $46,000. Um, we do have an asterisk here. Uh, we are uh, recommending for Gil Bain that they proceed on a time and materials basis. Um, so this cost is an approximation. Um, they will be tracking uh, labor hours and materials, much like Nancy uh, presented earlier, where there'll be work tickets. And so every hour it takes to complete it will be thoroughly accounted for and they won't bill. Uh, any more than it takes to actually complete the work. Um, this work will be funded uh, mostly from existing project allowances. Um, however, a small portion of this would be funded from the project contingency. And so on the left here, like I said, to maintain schedule, ensure that the school has uh, adequate fresh air for when the uh, uh, students arrive, uh, the R2 is delivered on site and, and placed on the uh, newly installed steel. Uh, so are there any questions that I can answer at this point regarding this item? So this isn't a traditional bill, bid process. We're not going to just bid this out or? So the unit prices during the bidding, because you know it's, it's understood that uh, allowance uh, spending and additional items will always come up. Mm -hmm. What Gilbane does to make sure that the district is getting competitive prices, ask for unit prices. So a contractor at the time of bid will have to provide a unit price. For example, in this instance, they provided uh, you know, ductwork is priced on a per pound basis. Gotcha. So with this proposal, there was about 3,100 additional pounds of ductwork. So we could go to that unit price and, make, and have a predictable price that was competitively bid. And like I said, due to the uh, unusual material escalation that we've seen over the past uh, year or so, uh, it helps shield the district <coughs> from, uh, uh, from that uh, condition. Based upon the unit price, we've already paid for that though. Mm -hmm. No, the unit price is for additional items that are beyond the base contract. So, so we're not bidding this? No, this would be funded under uh, original contracts and, and if there's specific questions. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to make sure I'm understanding how we're doing this because this is different than sure. what we've usually done. So I'm so, trying to make sure I understand. So just as a, as, a, as a brief example about how we use unit costs, um, we, have, we have a, a whole sheet of unit costs that we'll put in there. These are things that we may expect to see uh, some changes come during construction. So, uh, for example, um, what we if we would put a unit cost, uh, we have a contractor that's providing doors. We put a unit cost in for a door. 
if we need to buy a door during the during the course of construction, we go back to the contractor and said, you're going to provide us a door for the price that you put in here. That's how much we're buying a door for, not how much you think you can give it to us now. You've already told us how much you're going to sell us a door for. Gotcha. Yeah, I'd like to know, do you have any insurance to cover your design mistakes? Well, um, this is a this is an example of a uh, an, a situation where um, we take all of the all the considerations of the of the existing conditions that we're able to see. Um, we we in this case we see uh, condition A, B, C, and D in this area are all all the same. So an assumption is made that condition E will match that. Um, because we don't have any evidence to the contrary that it, that it doesn't. Um, we don't have any documents that were that are provided for this uh, from the original time of construction, and observations are able to provide to show us that um, that it's anything contrary. So in this case, uh, the the estimate the the assumption that was made um, does not match the actual condition. Um, so that's that's the challenge that we that we have here. Um, but what what happens in this case is that, you know, as Carl described, the, the ultimate solution that was provided um, is very similar to what we would have done if, if it had been discovered in, in its place. And, and, and honestly, if, if we had discovered the, the non-bearing wall in its place, we probably would have gone the, the route of reinforcing that with steel, um, which would have cost equal or greater than the, the solution that you have before here today on bid day. I can't make that that exactly certain, um, but that's that's the that's the estimation here. And and you know it's an unfortunate unfortunate situation, but again we're dealing with you know buildings that are um, of, a, of a vintage of the, uh, that we don't have all the information that we can have. So again we have to work through. Um, our best opinions on that, and sometimes those those don't fully work out. So what percentage? Shouldn't it have, excuse me, shouldn't it have been tested? Um, again, as I said, it, it, as 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 we look at conditions, we, we make our best professional estimate on what what that may be. Um, this is similar to you know similar to other other locations where we're where we're correct in this one in this instance. Um, it ended up being something different. Than it was, and, and in hindsight, additional investigation may have been made. Um, but again, we we uh, we we always have to cut off the point at which we're we're making significant investigation into into things in the building. Um, if we do, if we have a reasonable level of confidence in what that might, what the actual uh, actual situation might be, um, because we could. That, that ends up spending more district money up front that, that may not be necessary, or more time up front that may not be necessary. So, th those are all professional judgment calls, and sometimes, um, sometimes it goes to the, to the different direction. The question we should help with this. Um, this is, since this is a this is again a value uh, an added value to the to the district, and that you're getting material that, that you wouldn't have gotten before. Um, it's not a. It's not a, a um, anything that would fall under. We're, it, if it was something in which we we're tearing out something that, that that had been previously installed in order to deal with that, then we would be then we would be looking at that as a, as an issue um, where we'd be talking to. But in this case, we're able to use the the material that was purchased and the the installation that was done. Um, it's just something in order to make the existing conditions work. We have to add uh, something to that. So, how much will this cost out of the contingency fund for us? Um, this comes out of out of uh, allowance and small a small amount from the 3.4 million dollars in contingency that was available mm -hmm. to the project. So, some of this will be coming out of the contractor's allowance. Some some of it will be coming out of the contingency. But you don't know how much. Uh, of the, the, of yeah, the, the exact allocation will be managed by Gill Bank as they hold all the contracts with the subcontractors. So it depends on the size of the uh, contractor's uh, allowance. Um, just based on uh, a, a quick look, there is substantial money left for that particular contract. Uh, however, it is anticipated that there would be something uh, possibly beyond the allowance that's already built into that contract. 
uh, you know, Bill Bain assigns different allowance values to the individual contractors. So how much exterior duct work are we adding? Is that going straight down to the original plan? So the amount of exterior duct work added uh, is about 3,100 pounds or about uh, 50 linear feet of supply or 50, li li and 50 linear uh, feet of return. Can you go back to the, to the picture? So this is like getting a blank, getting a blank check. We're not, we're not even getting a number of uh, what this is going to cost or how much in contingency. We're just saying what they're going to do and so they'll come back and tell us that. Well, this, is, this is the estimate that was provided. There is no, there is no blank check. Okay, so this is what, hold on Ms. Kelly, hold on, he's explaining it. So this is the estimate that was provided to to Gilbane by the contractor who's performing this work. So it's going to cost 45 dollars So this is the maximum amount okay. that, you, that the district would be paying here. Gotcha. Uh, and and why we say we don't know if it's going to be coming out of all allowances or all con contingencies is we don't know what the amount uh, left in the allowances is to date. So we know that there is you know, a significant amount of money that was held on, on contingency. Gilbane's controlling the, the allowances here. But as it is on time, we recommended to proceed on a time and material basis. The number that you see, the 45888, that's the maximum that the district would, would be paying. Well, members, the only reason I asked for how many linear feet of duck work he's using because, because of that we're going to lose efficiency, so our bills will be greater now from then on because of the, the, the original design didn't work. 50 feet is a lot, even if it's insulated, so we are going to use them to lose a lot of, you know, we're going to lose the efficiency of the actual RT. And, and moving forward, have we assessed, is West going to have the same problems, and what about when we begin to do other floors? Uh, West doesn't have any uh, rooftop units. Okay. Those are all individual uh, uh, units in the classrooms. Yeah. So no issues there. Not talking about what we begin to do because we're putting these units on at West too. We will not. Be we will not. Okay. So and and at, yeah, and at East, um, uh, you know, again, and this this ahead. unit is sized to serve the lower floors. This gotcha. is the only time. It's the only time in the process of air conditioning the building okay. that you will ever place. So we won't have to be doing this for the other no. floors. Or, we gotcha. we are stubbing uh, ductwork above the ceiling gotcha. throughout the third floor, so that way the uh, uh, scope of work to expand to the lower floors is as minimal as possible. Great. Okay. Can we go on with the footages, Mike, Mr. Beltier has asked us? Is it 40 feet? Is it 50 feet? How 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 long is it? Right, so you see uh, two, uh, you know, in the red here, this is the uh, return air ductwork and the supply air ductwork. Um, right. It's approximately 55 feet for the supply and slightly less than 50 feet for the return. Yes, sir. And the, the engineer has, has uh, uh, you know, sized this ductwork, uh, so th and it's insulated, so that way it still is adequate to meet all the, uh, all the loads. I can certainly get some information on them if there's any impact to the efficiency of the unit. I mean, I'm sure it is. You got 100 feet of, you know, 50 of supply and 50 of return. Even if it's insulated, you're going to lose something versus just going straight down in the original design. I just think, I mean, we know when we, when we first hired uh, uh, Perkins and Willow, you guys knew that this was an old building and you knew you were going to get into these issues here, but I, I'm looking at it, it's just too many now. You know, it's just, it's too many. <laughs> and I understand, I understand you're, you know, you got to design, you got to investigate, I mean, x-ray walls, whatever you got to do, but I mean, I think it's got to get a lot better. You've been there for a while now, and you should you already know the building. I mean, we got to get some type of accountability here. I mean, we're just putting out, putting out, and putting out, and nobody's helping yeah. us, you know. We're very heavy to money to build this thing, and, we are, we and we're just, you know, you've been doing this for years. This is this happens, and, and, and I think you guys should be trying to avoid these type of things. Some are unavoidable. I understand that, but one after the other, one after the other is just not acceptable. But we understand the frustration. Yeah. Um, and you're right. We have we have done. I mean, we kind of shared the cost at least something. I mean, it's just us paying out. I, I, that's not right. Yeah, we've done a significant amount of work um, right. within right. within buildings of this age, and we know that. We always uncover things that are that are not going to be predictable. Yeah, I thought we have um, a that's the big challenge here. And, and we brought and what we brought has been you know three issues that before the, the before the board here um, that are unpredictable issues. I so have, I have a question. We have three or four questions. If what strategy <coughs> has Perkins and Will put in place to um, limit the potential of uh, change orders? 
Uh, we, we do significant, uh, head of, we want to make sure that we're, we're uh, reviewing existing conditions as much as possible ahead of time. That's both uh, in the field and documents. So uh, we, we, we get our hands dirty, we go above ceilings, we go walk through the buildings, we tear open things where we don't know the answers are. Uh, we look at and, re and review documents, we work with our engineers, work with the building teams to make sure that's done. On the, uh, on the flip side, we also provide um, alternates allowances and contingencies for the project because of the age of the building, uh, that because we know that, that unforeseen conditions are going to pop up, um, that we can deal with those without having to come to come to the district or the board for additional uh, cost of those, um, just to be able to use the, the funds that are already allocated to the project. Uh, can you share your exploratory structural report that should have been completed before um, designing the rooftop? We we don't have a we don't have a process by which we go through an exploratory structure. That we report. don't have. Um, we go through and we we examine uh, on an individual basis uh, each one of the conditions uh, to try to, to to mitigate any of these issues as much as possible. The structural engineer reviews documents, reviews field conditions, and they go through and they engineer each one of those conditions as as they. The structural engineer that was hired by Perkins and Will. Yes. Mm -hmm. What specialty does he or she, because I don't know if it's a man or woman, uh, what do they specialize in? Uh, the structural engineers that we work with, we work with on a number of uh, projects. They work on anything from uh, tall tower uh, structures to uh, K-12 buildings. Um, the team that we've worked with, that we're working with here, we've worked with extensively on K-12 buildings, including buildings of this uh, of this uh, vintage, and um, they've done you know extensive work within the district on this project um, today as well. So Perkins is will, uh, uh, and I just want to be sure, Dr. Henderson is our our architect of record. Is that correct? Perkins and Will? Yes, that's correct. And what do we pay Perkins and Will? How much? Mr. Doctor Contra, do you know? Enough, enough you have, Before you get that answer, um, enough, enough how many senior engineers do you have on site when doing these um, investigations? Just tell us that. Are they all senior? Do you have one of these? How many? Do you at least have several senior engineers, especially for this building out here? Or is, uh, they just uh, subordinates to the senior engineer? Um, we have licensed engineers who review existing conditions. No, it's a senior engineer. I don't know that the term senior engineer, engineer has to be licensed. means anything in the in structural engineering. That's a, that's a term. That's a the reason line. I say senior is just because it will be somebody with 50 years experience or more, and it's in charge of most of the, all the engineers. So I would like to know how serious you guys take our school. I would like to know how many senior engineers have visited our site to evaluate. I, I can certainly ask the the, uh, the structural engineer for that. I know that we have we have licensed and, and senior engineers <coughs> who have been on site uh, consistently throughout the design and the, and the construction process, um, reviewing uh, existing conditions, reviewing installed conditions. Um, we don't just have we we have not. Um, this is not something that is staffed inappropriately. Mm -hmm. um, isn't K, isn't the former company called K and G? I can't remember what the company's name is now. Aren't they, aren't they the structural engineers that you guys work with? No, the structural engineers for the project are CE engineers. Okay, but they weren't called K and G before. No, because there was a one of the engineers that used to work. He, he knew proviso. Yeah, that was KJWW. Thank you, KJWW. I'm, I'm the wrong. I was talking about. Yeah, and they, they knew the building, but that was one of the reasons why we had made sure that they worked. And KGWW uh, was brought forward as a, as we went through a vetting process right. with, the, with the entire FMP team on engineers. They, they were brought as, a, as through the vetting process, ultimately uh, as, as mechanical engineers. Uh, ultimately, we ended up going with Laura on here and uh, and Anderson for structure. Okay. And what was it that they could pay the money? Do you know? I 
do not know uh, the hourly rate that we pay. We're not looking at the hourly rate. What we give Perkins and Will the check every month, right? Do you know the amount of that check? If not, it's okay. You can just I, find out. I, 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 Let I me don't. Know. I don't know that amount. I'd love to um, uh, have a chance to get that information and provide it to our commissioners. In my mind, we pay them quite a bit a month. My last question is. How was this structure issue? How, how was it missed? Well, like I said, I think I think this is a this is a case where we make assumptions based on existing conditions that, that we, we believe uh, one place will match another place. Uh, we don't have any observations in the field to the contrary. Um, so we've made we've made an assumption here and approved out after opening up that that was an incorrect assumption. Yes, yeah. Nine more pages to go. Yes. Okay, but as fiduciary officers, we need to be able to answer these questions. I know it's late, and I know it may be taxing to ask you guys this question, no. but um, no, it's it's we we fully understand yep. um, the, the need for for accountability on on this, and uh, that's that's why we bring as much information. We want to be as transparent about the process. We're not making excuses on, on what, what uh, transpired um, when opening up the building here. Um, but um, you know, for, for the sake of this, if there's any other questions on that, we'll be happy to answer them um, as thoroughly as, as we can. Um, getting to the, the sequence two completion, we are wrapping up the sequence two work just as an understanding. Um, we have two different phases that, that we'll go through in completion, and we'll go through this in, in uh, both. At East, we'll go through it in two phases where we are for the, the main uh, building and the stadium. So you'll see two different approaches. At West, we'll do this for the, the main building, uh, where we go through our substantial completion phase. Uh, we've had our ROE walk through. Uh, we'll continue discussing with the ROE um, as the project continues to work. You know, we have almost two weeks worth of work that's that's going to be done here in the next week because of the, the double shifts that are being performed here. Um, so the building's going to look a lot different and we're going to talk through that with the ROE um, uh, this coming weekend. Um, then we'll go through and we'll do a punch list review of the punch list provided to us by the construction manager. Um, we've done our call inspections. Those are required by the state uh, to, to uh, review it as the project is completed. Um, we walked through the building with the district on a number of occasions uh, on a weekly basis through the project as well. After that, we will issue a certificate of, of uh, we will issue issue for an application for that um, certificate of, uh, of occupancy, and then we will also issue a uh, a certificate of substantial completion. So during the between that time of substantial completion and final acceptance. Um, that starts our warranty period for the project, so the year standard warranty begins at that point. But construction work will continue uh, ongoing on items that are either not completed from the punch list or, or items that need to be completed. Um, at final acceptance, you'll have all that list of items that, there that you see there will be completed. Training will be completed, the punch list will be done. Uh, close out documents, including warranties and manuals, and, and will be uh, will be sent and training will be completed. Uh, and then we'll have final pay application and a uh, the general occupancy survey. And then we'll schedule, we've scheduled, as we've done on the projects that have been completed to date, we schedule a, a walk through one year out, uh, less than a one year out, so that we're able to identify any items that need to be completed within that warranty period before the warranty period expires and the contractors can be brought back to do that work. Um, at East, the, the, the requested images for the grandstands here, you see there's three from the, the manufacturer that were brought together. Um, we, had, we, we had a list of schools that we had, had uh, brought to you last time. We looked through, we didn't have really good images of those. We can certainly go out and get them, but these are representative. As you saw also the image at the top of the slide here that shows uh, I, an image of what these, these bleachers will look like. So, Again, you have the closed off riser on the top, which really helps um, contain both materials from falling through the bleachers and also keeps any wind that comes through the bleachers onto the, onto the spectators uh, from under there. It also provides, as you can see in this bottom image here, a really good spark of color 
onto on the, the uh, field uh, as well. Um, so these are really uh, good representatives. You have the uh, press box, three three chamber press box, um, where you'll be able to control um, uh, sound and scoreboard from in there. Have two different areas for uh, either two different teams or uh, two different observers on either side there, as well as a uh, protected area on the top that is accessed through a hatch um, that you can do filming uh, during during games and during practices. The auto shop tunnel. The, the I'm sorry. 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 The the I'm sorry. Uh, is that booth <coughs> insulated? I'm sorry. The, the booth insulated. The booth is <coughs> insulated. It is not uh, currently air conditioned or heated. Okay. Um, actually, it's heated. I'm sorry. It it's electrically heated. heated. Uh, that would be terrible. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> but but we don't have air conditioning in there. Um, what, what we've seen. This one is. Oh, this one's air conditioned. Oh. It is air conditioned. <laughs> We had in the past we haven't we've used uh, we used smaller units for that, but I think we've we've built that in. So that's good. And we'll go and we'll talk through the other <laughs> if, if you remember we talked uh, about the uh, West Auto Shop tunnel a while back. Um, and that was also sent out and we have some additional information. Hi. Um, I haven't uh, presented to you in a while, at least in person, so I just wanted to reintroduce myself. My name is Jessica Wagner. I'm an architecture partner as well. No relation. <laughs> no relation. You <laughs> see me. So uh, today we're discussing the, uh, the tunnel at Proviso West that connects the auto shop to the uh, Building E, which is close to the new advanced manufacturing lab. So this issue was first brought up to Bergen's and Will in, February, in uh, fall of 2019. And in January 2020, uh, there were three options that Bergen's and Will presented to the district in order to remedy the flooding and the structural concerns in this area. The selected option at that time was to demolish the tunnel entirely infill the building foundations, and then reconnect the utilities. In December of the same year, uh, bids to perform the tunnel work were received by Gillane, and the total approximated about $500,000. After receiving those bids back, the team suggested some more budget-friendly um, budget, uh, friendly alternatives to be considered. So this past spring, our structural engineer uh, performed an analysis of the existing tunnel. She went down underneath and examined everything. And uh, right after that, she provided some recommended, recommended actions to Bill Bain for cost estimating. So where we are right now is uh, cost estimates have been provided to the district for consideration. Uh, Bill Bain is currently reviewing the possibility of performing this work during the fall 2021 semester. Now to show you some images of what we're talking about, uh, these first two images at the top, uh, these uh, are these can be seen while walking the corridor above the tunnel. And this is how we first noticed that there might be a potential of issue below the tunnel, is that uh, it was observed that there was some buckling of the terrazzo in the metal strips. So the remainder of the images show what our structural engineer found after going under the tunnel itself. Um, of most concern, uh, there is a slab that was deflected as well as some cracking. Uh, there were cracks and spalls in the pier. Um, there was a corroded metal duct. Um, and then also some broken rebar as well. So uh, following the investigation, there were two recommended actions. Uh, the first one is to provide temporary shoring of the tunnel tap top slab. Uh, and also to uh, pause on all vehicle uh, traffic over this area. And I believe the district had done this right away after receiving the structural report. Uh, so the first, the first recommended action is for a temporary action only. The second one is a more permanent action, uh, and this is to replace the top structural slab, provide additional waterproofing. And also I want to let you know this is to only reduce water infiltration, not to fully eliminate it. The only way to fully eliminate any water infiltration is to remove the issue completely. Uh, the estimate for this work is $200,000, so that is $300,000 less than the original estimate uh, that was uh, given about a year ago. 
So also another uh, recommendation uh, that was provided to the district at that time is to do some additional testing options to have a better idea of what the structural condition as well as the subgrade water conditions that exist right now. We do have existing um, drawings of this area, but after the investigation, it was determined that the drawings that exist uh, do not, uh, the actual condition doesn't fully adhere to the drawings that we have. So providing these additional options will give us a really, a much better idea of the existing conditions. The only way to fully know what is in the tunnel is to perform the investigation, but these testing options will provide us a much better idea of what the tunnel, um, the construction of the tunnel, as well as the sub subgrade uh, water conditions. Thank you guys. Thanks. And that concludes the facilities uh, report. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Be safe out there. Thank you. That concludes the uh, Great. All right. Moving right along to the consent agenda portion of the meeting. Are there any items to be pulled from the consent agenda? Yes. I'd like to pull 14G and I would like to pull 14K. The entire thing? Um, yeah, so that, or no, I just want to vote on it separately. Just, okay, 14G yeah. and 14K. So we can discuss it when we get there. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, you want to pull the entire, are you saying the entire so personnel? So I'm, I'm pulling the entire personnel so then we can discuss it because I know we have a different actions to take once we get to the personnel report. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? I mean, yeah, we can or we can just pull those individual, individual items. items. Or just pull them now? Yeah, we can just pull them. Yeah. That's what we usually do. We can prove everything. Because well, right. if you pull the whole thing, then we can, then we can, I guess we could do it either way. But we usually just pull the items. That's fine. Pull, I so mean, in that case, um, just I would like to pull why can't we go back to having everything individual like we've had for a while? It would be so much easier. When you become president, you can do that. Yeah. I would like to pull in the personal <laughs> report of uh, 14K section two certified staff number five and 15 and. I'm still in 14K, now I'm on section uh, three, non-certified staff, number 13. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'm sorry? I, I thought I had one other one. Okay, take your time. I didn't hear you. Let's see. You're talking about this one right there? I'm talking about Okay, you, you pulled, you pulled 14, yes. 13, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, no, I. Okay, great. We get a motion. <coughs> was that B13? That was, oh, uh... I need to put 14A also minutes. 14A. <coughs> You're pulling A and J. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Can I get a motion to 
approve the consent agenda minus item 14 4 c item 14 a item 14 j item 14 g item 14 k item 14 k 2 section 2 numbers 5 and 15 and item 14 k section 3 item 13 did I get 4C? Yes. Yeah, I said 4C. 14K4C. 14K4C. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was the one Mrs. Patterson asked before. Okay. Oh, yeah. I put in, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 14K4C. And I don't know why I put it up here instead of down here. Got gotcha. you. Thank you, sir. Second. Ms. Grant, no, I'm sorry. Discussion? Ms. Grant, please call the roll. Um, sure, Mrs. Patterson? Aye. Ms. Grant, aye. Mr. Beltieres? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Mrs. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Medina? Abstain. Mr. Alexander? Aye. The motion carries. Can I get a motion to approve item 14A? Minutes? So moved. Second. Discussion? Uh, I need to, um, I, I wasn't here for those minutes, so I need to make sure that I, you know, I'm not on the same Okay. Any other discussion? Ms. Grant, please call the roll. Uh, sure, Ms. Grant. Aye. Uh, Mr. Beltieros? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Mrs. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Medina? Abstain. I wasn't present. Yes. Mrs. Patterson? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Uh, motion carries. Can I get a motion to approve consent agenda item 14J? So um, moved. Second. Discussion? You said, you, uh, you said J, correct? Yes, uh huh. J. Okay. Discussion? Sorry. Yeah, discussion. Um, so um, this was the time where you asked that I could um, ask questions about the bill list. No, we're on we're on J. I thought you said we're the a tentative G. budget. Oh, you should have put You would do that. I thought you just said G, the bill list. Yeah, but we're on J. Okay. I said 14J. We're getting it. Yeah, we're getting it. We're at 14J right now. You pulled 14J. Okay. That's what you, okay. Yeah. But you clawed it, pulled 14J. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, Ms. Grant, please call the roll. Mr. Beltieres? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Mrs. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Medina? Nay. Um, Okay, Mrs. Peterson. Aye. Ms. Grant. Aye. Mr. Um, Alexander. Aye. Motion carries. I get a motion to approve item 14G. Bill list. So moved. Second. Discussion. Yeah, we continue to have an issue with the corporate Mastercard. Uh, now it's up to twenty-one thousand seven hundred forty-eight. Why is that a problem? Um, it used to be maybe four thousand, then it went up to eight thousand. Now it's been going up, then it went up to 12,000, now we're up to 21,748, and it's not detailed. What page are you on? We have no on? idea what it's on there. And we can detail what happens to the culinary people. Ms. Medina, what page are you on? But we don't you? have anything on a detail of what it is that's being paid on the corporate master card. What page are you on, man? It's on page, um, it says page one, but it's inside, the, it's at the end of the bill list. And it's the corporate master card. Just page one because at the end yeah, of the Yeah, page one. All of them say page one. Oh, yeah, no. Page one of the bill list is actually page 42 of the board book. The number would be on the top, but it's superimposed with the um, so, bill. So, yeah, page 140. So, if you go to the bill section right. and you just turn the page, it's so all the way back to 140 something. Page 42. Um, I think that's what she's saying, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. right, so what is it specifically that you're requesting? I'm not understanding your discussion. We have historically gotten a detail of what it is that's on the corporate MasterCard, and it's always been listed. We haven't gotten a list now for months. And since it has gone up, so it's gone up $10,000 in just the last couple of months. I don't see it. For $21,748.30 in expenses, those things should be detailed. That's a lot of money. I don't see it at all. What page are you guys on? No, ma'am. Okay. What, what page are we on? 
Yeah, I'm not buying what you're talking about. Okay, go to 149. Okay. And then go two, two three pages back and you'll see it. Gotcha. It's on the very bottom. So the pages at the the page numbers for the bill list are on the top of the page, but sometimes they get hit with the numbers. Yeah. Do you see it? Yeah. It's the last listing on that page. Yeah. So maybe a solution to this would be to have itemized credit card statements. Yes. In the bill list. I agree. Where they do that at? We always have to so itemize the bill and everything. If you brought a pencil, I've never seen that. No. Four years I've been on the well, for, it's been going I mean, on thousands you know, and thousands every month. I'm trying to understand what is it that you're looking for. Just say what you're looking for. Just, just say what you're looking for. Transparency. It, that is transparency. Yeah, there's no itemization. That's no, no transparency. No, you're looking for something specifically. Yes, transparency. Okay. So, so, okay, so, so <laughs> the discussion's on the table, and you're saying that because I still can't even find it. I don't know which you got. So I can look at it at least have it. Even actual transparency in 2019. There you go. Because it was itemized in 2019. Right now, we're putting something on the table. Uh, no, we're about to vote on the. Uh, we're about to vote to pay the bills. Yeah, we're about to vote to pay the bills. We've had the discussion. Point taken. Any other discussion? I do have a question. About yes. Uh, if you look on page 114 of the bill list, there's a. Uh, entry for dude solutions. Um, if someone could remind me, one, what they are, but two, I've seen this group come up a lot and I'm worried that we might be daisy chaining rather than have gone out to bid for a service that we are stringing along larger amounts and we're going to be over our limit where we're supposed to have bid. So I would like some more information on that. One forty one. One fourteen. Yeah, do solutions they provide okay. it's a work order system and software that lets you track um, oh, maintenance yeah. jobs and, and IT jobs. It's a way to uh, manage your delivery of services to individual teachers and departments. So if I have an issue with my computer, I can I can put that job into do school school do. And then it goes to the IT department, and so they're just able to track it and able to measure what they're doing. It's like a customer management system? Yeah, and there also TripDirect, it manages all of the trips within the district, okay. um, buses and minivans. Do we, I just want to make sure that we're not violating our own policy. So do we go, like, go out to bid for this, or how much have we paid this vendor? Because I don't want us to accidentally be over the bid amount and have not gone out to bid. We paid them roughly about 20 $1,000 a year. We did go out to be uh, several years ago when we first acquired this platform. Okay. Um, and they were the lowest responsible bidder related to the platform mm -hmm. pieces that we needed within the school. Uh, so, we've so had the same vendor for several years? They've been here for four years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is, just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. then, is it possible to maybe would it be time to maybe rebid a system like this to see if there's a better price out there since we've been with the same company for so long? The main problem with that is that we um, we, we sit a lot of our infrastructure on Scoodoo, uh, like all of our exterior pipes, all of our rooftop units, all our in interior plumbing. So we would actually have to pay someone to shift all that information over to a different platform. Okay. Uh, and it had taken us quite some time to build that infrastructure. Okay. And um, it would be monumental to do that with another company. But okay. no doubt we can explore um, to make sure we get a fair price. And if they're out of line, we can ask them to provide the superintendent with a, a, a price that we can live with. Fellow board members, pending, pending the explanation, if there's no reason to have any issues with the services recommended by the superintendent, I would not recommend that we start fishing for 
This is the one you show me that when the teacher's got a problem, they'll say what it is, and then it goes to you on the computer, you check it, you send somebody to fix it, right? Correct. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. I remember so, I was showing this yeah. one time. If there's a, an issue outside, uh, we also make sure that that information goes on for uh, setups, uh, sports, for example, football. Football field needs to be lined. Uh, if they're going to need additional manpower there because it's homecoming, oh. all of that stuff is put into school to do so we can support the event. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah. So on the AT&T <laughs> mobility, um, there's the cell phone. So some cell phones, it, just, it says one here. So I just want to understand. It says 2470 for one cell phone. And then for another one, 5198 then another, it says one cell phone, 2,862, and another cell phone, 2,539. Is that for an entire year? It, well, we get these every month, so I want to know what is going on there. Did you is that we, one so cell phone, is that a group, is it a service, like what in the world is going on? No, I'm asking you, Ms. Medina, you're saying that we pay $2,000 a month for AT&T for one cell phone? <laughs> Are you going on record saying that that's what we pay every month? This, that's, this, no, what I am saying is that's what is written here. It's that's what's written here phone. this month. You it just said we do it every one. month. No. It says okay. 2,470. So for, if, if, is that, I'm asking for clarification because we get these exorbitant AT&T charges and I want to know what they're for. Why because did, if why it's a cell phone and it says one, okay. is it really can, can you one let, cell phone? Can, can you let him answer the question? You're asking me why I was asking I'm the question. Done I'm done answering. You're, you're not answering. Just let him answer the question, please, man. I don't know the specifics of that, but I'm happy to research it. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion? Yeah. Just to give a little clarification, I, I remember I asked a question about that. I think it's the at and <laughs> voice over IP service. I'm not sure, but I think that might be it. We've been talking about VOIP for years. We've yeah. never done that. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know what the... We will be bringing that to you all. Yeah. What was it? What was that for sure? No, no voice, voice over IP. It's just like WhatsApp and... and yeah. Messenger, you know, gotcha. that type of point. Okay. Any other discussion? Any work? Are we getting item? Are you going to be itemizing the credit card? No. So we didn't agree to we didn't, we didn't agree that. Can we agree to that or no? You can, if it pleases the board, if you got four board members that would like to request Dr. Henderson itemize the credit card, then board speaker it was direction. Itemized we heard so you, Ms. Medina. Can, we, can, we, see if we, can we see if other people you got three more board members? Yeah, I don't care. If, I don't care. Uh, if people recall, I actually asked for this last month during your business. Okay, great. So that's two, that's three. Anybody else? Okay, so no, we will not be itemizing it. You guys got three, not four. Um, it will continue as it is. Uh, any other discussion? Ms. Grant, please call the roll. Mr. Wagner. Aye. Mrs. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Medina. Nay. Mrs. Patterson. Aye. Mrs. Grant. Aye. Mr. Beltier is. Aye. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Motion carries. Can I get a motion to approve item 14? Okay. Which? No, so we. I'm sorry. 14K. I. Two. No, I. Mm -hmm. we, we were going to um, table. Yeah, yeah. We were going to table. Let me strike. Let me strike. Let me, re let me reword it. Okay. You're right. Can I get a motion to table? 14K. 14K. a Section 2A5. And 15. And 15. Thank you. I would, uh, yes, I will so, yes. So Second discussion? Yes. Ms. Graham, please follow the roll. I'm sorry, who seconded it? I did. Okay. <laughs> sorry. It's to, table, it's to table 14K. 2K. A five and fifteen. Right. We're just tabling those two. Yeah. Um, so okay. Uh, voting five and fifteen. You mean five and fifteen? Yes. Um, it's thirteen. No. Is that another one? That's a, That's a different one. No. I thought that was a different number. No. Uh, Ms. Grant, I. Mr. Beltieres. Take your time. Sir. Any you know what we're talking about? Thank no. Oh, the table, yeah, I remember. Yeah. The one with the... The tabling? Yeah. So that's an I, Sam? 
Yes, hi. Uh, Mr. Wagner? Aye. Mrs. Kelly? Mrs. Medina? Kurt Tablin? Aye. Mrs. Patterson? Aye. Uh, Mr. Alexander? Aye. Uh, it has been tabled. Great. Can I get a motion to approve item 14, section 313? So moved. Second. Discussion? Yeah. I think that um, this, this position was not even posted for more than a couple of hours. It was barely posted, and people were not able to um, be able to um, apply for this internally. And the, the, the salary is outrageous for somebody who has no education experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other discussion? Um, yeah, I, I do feel like the salary is exorbitant, and I, I honestly feel like this is um, a slap in the face to all the support staff we have. I mean, there are plenty of support staff in the school that would love to be having a $30,000 raise. Let, let me be clear. This is not a support position. This is an administrative position. Any other discussion? And, and again, though, they would have loved a chance to apply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so not the Any other discussion? Tonight. Any other discussion? For the record, um, and, and, and I, I think I mentioned this to Board Member Wagner, the superintendent has a right to determine who's going to work for him and who's going to work in that sensitive position uh, as his assistant. It's not something that you can just, you know, reach out and willy-nilly choose someone for. Um, I supported the previous administration, and the superintendent has a right to present to us who he feels is the best qualified. And to question him would put us on his level and say that we have the educational knowledge to tell him who can be his assistant and do the job. So we can either vote it up or down, but I take issue with board members challenging our superintendent who we've hired to tell him who's qualified to work as his assistant because nobody up here has a PhD in education. So let us be clear when we're talking to people who are qualified that we've hired to do a job that we do so respectfully. I, to rebut that, okay, then I would just like to rewind everyone's memory to about 20 minutes ago when a bunch of people questioned architects and everybody for so long. Why do we do that? Because we're protecting our assets. I, I do think that, do not talk, don't talk when to I'm like talking. That. Don't talk to me. Do like not interrupt me, Claudia. Do not interrupt me. Claudia, you don't have the floor. It is <laughs> our best interest to protect <laughs> our assets. And if we can question the architects that we've hired, then we can certainly ask questions about this. I do think it's strange that we're hiring the wife of someone who we've already hired to work here, who moved here from another state, has relocated with this family, and now the wife needs a job. And she may be qualified, she may not be qualified. I don't know. We talked about that previously, listing qualifications. That would help drastically, but I am saying I am not comfortable with this position. Point that is my opinion as a member. Point taken. Any other discussion? Ms. Graham, please call the roll. Sure. Mr. Valtieres. Aye. Mr. Wagner. Aye. Mrs. Kelly. Come back to me, please. Mrs. Medina. Nay. Mrs. Patterson. Aye. Mrs. Grant. Nay. Mrs. Kelly. Come back to me, please. You're the, the, last one. You're the last one. I'm the last one? Yeah. Other, other than Rodney. Other than me, I think I Rodney, I always call him last. You want to go after me? Yeah, I didn't do that. I thought I could count. You can call me. I thought I could count. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mrs. Kelly. <clears throat> Can I get a motion to approve item 14K4C? So moved. Uh, the one you pulled. You pull 14K4. Little resource officer. Did anyone second? I'll wait. Second. Discussion? 4C. 14K4C. I can take mine back. I take my vote back. You take it? <laughs> <laughs> on, on the last vote. How do we do that? We have to re. We have to recall it. Can't you do that? You already called the motion passed, so you guys are technically have to re vote it. Okay. That's a, and that's the decision of who? The board. Well, the, it, it, initially it would be your decision. If you denied it, then I guess somebody could appeal the decision to the chair and you could vote on it whether you want to do it. But once you call the vote passed, right. then the vote stands. Thank you. So the vote's passed and stands. We're not recalling it. 
Um, back to the, the motion on the floor. Oh, okay. Item 14, 4 D. Please do. Okay. Item 14, 4 D. You know I will. Yes, yes ma'am. I'm sorry, four, Ms. Kelly, can I please? please? Oh, 14, 14, 4 C. School oh, yeah. research. Can I get, we got a motion on the floor and the motion for the second. Can I get any discussion? Discussion. Um, I will vote for all the other, all resource officers on the exception of Carlos Patterson, who every now and then, uh, probably for the last 13 years, have worked as a resource officer at Proviso East. Let me repeat that. I will vote for every resource officer on the exception of Carlos Patterson, who can work for the district probably about 13 years as an SRO. Carlos Patterson is my son. I, I think that we're, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, I think we're just voting on the pay rate adjustment yeah, for yeah, all of them. That's correct. Well, right, so you would just abstain from the whole thing. So there's no like voting for all others. It's not presented in a way okay, that. Okay, so whatever it is. Okay, so I can. Just, just, just the for the yeah. position. <laughs> okay. What was it previously? What was the pay rate? Yeah, was the SR officer's previous rate? You know, I'll, I'll just double check. I think it was $20 an hour. They've been making $20 for 20 years. Okay. Okay. Okay, so from what I understand, and, and Mr. Gleason, help me out here. This is for a pay rate adjustment. This isn't for hiring. No. So she would not have to absolve herself from a decision. No, under, under the policy, she should. She's she doing should. the right okay. thing. Okay, I'm just, it, it I'm just making sure. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. I, I'm just yeah, trying to make sure that, this is, that we're not hiring. This is for, he's already an employee. So. He's her son. She's right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, she did the right thing. Any actions involving hey, she should. Gotcha. Right. Okay, just clarification. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, any other discussion? <coughs> Ms. Grant, please call the roll. Uh, sure. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Mrs. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Medina? Nay. Mrs. Pearson? Nay. Oh, abstain. I'm sorry. Abstain. Abstain. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get my homework. Before you have to pick that. She abstains. She has to abstain. Uh, Ms. Grant, aye. Mr. Valtieres. Aye. Uh, Mr. Alexander. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, where are we? Can't have a side. <laughs> I, I, speak, speak. Okay, listen. We have to. If we're going to discuss this, we have to discuss it openly. Yeah. We cannot. I cannot go over here with you. <laughs> New business. Hearing none, old business. No, old business, oh. new business, which one? New business. business. We're on new business. New business. Old business. First. Is it old business first? Old business. I'm sorry. Old business. Yeah. So um, I know a few years back when uh, the other administration was here, I always uh, I had a lot of people out in the community complain about the registration process. So I, I think during that time, we took the initiative as a board and we tried to make things a little better and kind of get that uh, online process going early in the year. Uh, you know, so we wouldn't have the last minute registration even though we still have it. So I just want to point out there, I mean, uh, this is a community out there, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but uh, I just hear it, but when I hear it from somebody that I know, it, it just gets too close to me. So I, I hear that they're, you know, they're not answering emails, or they're not, you know, they, a lot of people have issues with registration, and I'm not saying that's the case, this is what's out there. Uh, usually what I do, I, I direct them to the process, I want this to work for everyone. I just want my neighbor that knows me because I said on the board, I want this to work for everyone. I was direct when they, you know, go to the school, email them. But if they don't answer emails, I mean, what else are they going to do? So I just, uh, you know, want to let the board know and maybe uh, our superintendent to tell the uh, whoever's in charge of registration to maybe, you know, try to answer those emails and be more diligent. Especially as we get to the start of school, as people always do think the last minute, I know I, I'm one of them, I'm guilty of that. 
So just wanted to point that out. You know, I don't want to uh, spend my time or the superintendent's time registering somebody when there's staff to do this kind of work. You know, I don't want to, I wouldn't have to go to, to that extreme as to, you know, call the superintendent, hey, they got a problem. I don't want to do that. That's last resort. And I tell them, hey, if this doesn't work for you, then you call me. If all this stuff doesn't work, call me and then we'll take care of it. But it would be better if the administration did, did their job and, and answer the emails for registration and you know did their work, that's all. So I just want to put it out there because and I want to make it public because I've been getting this for the last month from different people all over the place. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I I would just echo what Sam has said is that uh, especially with at PMSA that there were a lot of registration pro problems and that there's been just so little communication. Yeah from school. So that's just a recurring issue that's popping up with parents, registration and communication. To me was it less than most people. Okay, thank you. Any other any other old business? Old okay. business. I'd just like to know uh, what has happened with my proposal for teacher recognition. The year is because it will begin next week. Has anything been started on here? Oh, thank you. Any other old business? Yeah, I would like to know uh, for Power School, when are the teachers actually going to get access to Power School? Because they don't know their rosters, there's information that they need to get, and, are, and with all of this that's going on with the roof, how is that going to impact teachers actually going in and setting up their classrooms? Because that's a big, it's a big problem. All right. Uh, we're in the process of uh, turning our access. As soon as we get all of our access, everything is straight. Because they, they don't know they how many students they have or anything yet. We're working today. Okay. When can we? When we, can? What about what time can we know that that's going to be available? Before school available? starts. Before school starts. So like the day before school starts. We're working to that end. What's going on with power school? I'm not understanding. What, what do you mean? What's going on? Yeah. Why isn't the access given to the teachers yet? Because they would get it prior to school. But why don't they have it already? Because so they can we're, prep we're for working classes. on our end. I'm sorry? We're working on our end. I understand. I'm just trying okay. to understand why the issue is <laughs> that, happening. That's, that's the answer. Any other old business? Um, old business. Um, Dr. Henderson, I heard tonight again at the start of a new school year as a mother of a 40 year old son. It aches my heart to sit here and because I understand education and we have been in and around it for so long and maybe others don't understand it as well when you're at the top it's lonely and many times you have to take the months and months and be browbeaten I'm going to pray that this school year that you because it looks like that's where we're trying some people are trying to head they're trying to put legs on something that took place in the state of Mississippi. And it's not getting any momentum. And so I don't know what it is that they want, but I am going to pray for you. I'm going to pray with you, Thank you. that you don't have to endure in another year of this. At the end of the day, you are human. You are somebody's child, husband, father, and if I will go to my grave saying this, if you've never lived in the state of Mississippi, you have no idea. When you consolidate a school district, that's when you consolidate schools in Mississippi, do your research and see why this consolidation is taking place. We're talking about a state they could care less. They don't hide their prejudice in the state of Mississippi. We do here. I am not interested, and I hope that we stop talking about what happened in the state of Mississippi. They consolidated a school district. It was for sure to be taken over whether Dr. Henderson was there, Dr. Jojo or Momo were there. It was bound to happen. So I'm going to pray for you and with you, sir. Thank you. Um, 
that note, Thank you, Ms. Patterson. I would like to talk about actually well, uh, having an investigation in regards to that audit. There's over 300 pages worth of information. Happen, it is it. my, it's my, it's my, I have, I, I don't care what you have. And I think Go we should be that. able to have an investigation <laughs> and a conversation <laughs> for the board. We were told by Dr. Henderson uh, that his district was a game. Ms. 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 Medina, Ms. Medina, Ms. Medina, Ms. Medina, Ms. Medina. You're not going to over talk now. I'll adjourn the meeting. I'm not, excuse me, I'll adjourn the meeting. And, and the Adjourned. fiscal responsibility was taken away. Meeting adjourned. Meeting adjourned. The dissolution of the board. This board should investigate. It is responsible. It was called 